Having found himself reincarnated into the My Hero world, our main protagonist will try to live up to his namesake. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Iron Man in MHA, Part 1. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Third person's POV. A woman with long brown hair was seen walking down a long corridor with doors on either side. When she reached the end of the corridor, she ended up in front of a large white door, bigger than the one she had passed. The door was covered in stickers with caution signs and images related to science. Tony, the woman called, knocking on the door, Tony dear, it's time to wake up. Hearing no response, the woman sighed before turning the doorknob. When she entered the room, she let out another large sigh. There was a little boy, about four years old, sprawled on the bed, buried in books. She couldn't help but massage her forehead at the sight, an image that had become all too common. She remembered the first time she saw it. She thought her baby had died. She went towards the large bed and started brushing all the books away. There was now a single large book over the boy's face as he snored soundly. The woman moved the book away from his face and shook the boy awake. Tony, wake up. It's time to wash up and come down for breakfast. The boy stirred awake and rubbed his eyes. Morning, mom. I'll be down in a minute. The mother nodded and began to leave. But as she was leaving, she turned towards Tony. Be sure to clean everything up as well. She saw how Tony put a thumbs up as he was stretching, and so she finally left. Tony let out a sigh as he laid back down on the bed and looked towards the high ceiling. It's been four years since I reincarnated as Anthony Stark in this crazy world. He thought to himself before hearing the door open once more. Oh, and Tony, happy birthday, the mother said with a large smile. Thanks, mom. Tony smiled back as the mother closed the door. Even my new parents' names are the same as they were for the original Tony Stark. My mother's name is Maria Stark, while my father's is Howard Stark. Tony got up and walked towards the nearest bathroom. When he entered, he saw maids in their regular uniforms waiting for him with towels in hand. When he saw them, he couldn't help but sigh. Do you guys stay in here and wait for me to come in every day? One of the maids, who had blue hair with pink tips, giggled. Of course not, young master. We're just already aware of your morning routine. Tony just smiled as he spread his arms and closed his eyes. Come on, beautiful maids. Take me. He heard them snickering as they took off his clothes before bringing him to the bath and bathing him. At first, he was a bit apprehensive when they bathed him, but after a while, he got used to it. Miss Lacey, bubbles please, Tony asked the maid with the blue hair. Certainly, young master, the maid said before putting her hand on the water. Bubbles started to escape from her hands. Are you excited, young master? The maid asked as Bubbles began to fill the bath. For what? If you're talking about my birthday, not really, since that means I'll have to go to school. The maid scoffed playfully at his answer. No, young master, I'm talking about getting your quirk. You are now four years old, which means your quirk will develop during this time. Oh, that, eh, I don't have big expectations for it. Tony shrugged his shoulders. The maid was washing his hair as Tony started playing with the bubbles. Afterwards, Tony was pulled out of the bath and dried off. He was then carried back to his room wrapped in a towel. You know, at first this was really embarrassing, but now that I've gotten used to it, I don't think I can live without it. I'm living like a king in this world, Tony happily thought. When Tony was brought to his room, they started dressing him in a cute little suit with a red bow tie, and his hair was combed back. Before my reincarnation, I was just a poor, penniless orphan doing whatever I could to survive. Now that I've had a taste of what wealth truly is, I don't want to give it up, Tony thought to himself as he instructed the maids to put all of his books back in their library. When he walked downstairs, he found his father, Howard Stark, 
with his mother, Maria Stark, waiting for him with a large cake and banners celebrating his birthday. Howard smirked upon seeing Tony. Look who it is. If it isn't the birthday boy, father dearest, Tony said in a teasing tone. They all sat down and began to eat a hearty meal, with big smiles on everyone's faces. So Tony, tell me, what do you want? Howard asked as he cleaned his mouth with a napkin. You know what I want, Dad, Tony replied. You truly want to go and explore Stark Industries that badly, huh? Howard sighed. I've said it once, and I'll say it again. Please, 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 please. Tony kept repeating with his hands in a praying position. Why do you even want to go there in the first place? Howard asked. Of course, for the arc reactor, why else? Tony said with an excited glint in his eyes. Howard smiled at Tony's excitement. Very well, Tony, you win. We'll go to Stark Industries. Yes, Tony shouted and punched the air. Howard smiled. Just getting to explore Stark Industries itself doesn't feel like a birthday present on its own. So you can ask for one more thing. Really? Tony asked in surprise. Howard responded with a nod. Then I want my own personal lab. For what? Howard asked in confusion. To experiment with things, obviously. Howard had a straight face as he said. I'm not letting a four-year-old be in a lab unsupervised. You can have Jarvis supervise me if you want. I'm not having my butler supervise you 24-7, Tony, just so you can play around. Play around? Who said I was going to be playing around? I need to start getting hands-on with inventions so I can have trials and errors. Otherwise, I can never hope to improve or bring forth ideas I have in my head, Tony said in a serious tone. Jarvis, who was standing behind Howard with his hands behind his back, smiled at Tony. I don't mind supervising the young master. In fact, I believe he may have a point. In order to learn, one must get their hands messy. He said as he winked at Tony. Howard looked at Tony, who was staring at him with expectation, and then at Jarvis. Very well. But if anything happens to the boy, Jarvis, be prepared to face the consequences. Jarvis put a hand over his heart. I'll watch him like a hawk. You have nothing to worry about. Howard nodded before they all cut the cake and ate a piece of it. Jarvis, please go and prepare the car, Howard instructed. Jarvis nodded and went on his way. Howard then turned towards Tony. Do you have everything you need, Tony? Tony excitedly nodded. Howard once again cleaned his mouth with a napkin as he stood up. Very well. Come on, let's go. Maria soon followed and took Tony's hand as she led him to where Jarvis was parked with the car. Third person's POV. Tony stared out the window of the car and in the far distance, he saw the towering building of Stark Industries. Tony was sitting next to his mother in the limo, while his father sat in front of them. So, tell me, Tony, do you remember what Stark Industries does? Tony nodded his head. It's a weapon manufacturer for heroes, but they don't only build weapons. They build costumes and other advanced gadgets for heroes. It's one of the leading manufacturers in the world, extending to multiple states with the largest one, or in other words, the main headquarters, being here in the United States. Howard smiled as he nodded. Yes, our company helps heroes all around the world with its technology. Keeping the peace and helping out those in need, Howard then reached over and started to pat Tony's head. And one of these days, you'll be the one to lead it. Who knows, you might even make it better, Tony only nodded as he kept looking out towards the building as it kept getting closer. They soon arrived, and as they did, Jarvis came and opened the door for them. Thanks, Jarvis, Tony said as he looked around. He saw people in costumes coming and going in and out of the main entrance. Some weren't even human, one had the body and head of a bull missing a horn, and another had the head of a Rubik's Cube. A man and a woman wearing black then appeared behind them. They had the typical bodyguard outfits with glasses and earpieces, their faces remaining stoic. The woman had short blonde curly hair, while the man had the horns of a ram curling downwards. So, we have bodyguards. That is so sick, Tony said, looking at the two of them before winking at the female one, who looked at him weirdly. Yes, yes we do. Most heroes in the world depend on us to provide them with the equipment they need. 
so we come onto the radar of a lot of villains because of it. Tony nodded, and thus started his tour of Stark Industries. He saw many people in lab coats talking among themselves, showing tablets to one another as they discussed the information presented to them. Howard showed Tony where people tested weapons on costumes, making some of them bulletproof and some even fireproof. He then showed him where the weapons were made and tested. Tony saw them testing a laser that burned through layer after layer of metal. They also constructed vehicles and other machines. By the end of it, Tony was tired of walking around so much. When they were in the elevator, Howard smiled down at Tony. And now for the thing you've been waiting for most. Howard took out some keys and inserted them into the elevator panel, unlocking a brand new floor. As he did, they started going down past the lobby further underground. The elevator door then opened, revealing scientists working around a large machine in the middle of the room. The machine was a wide cylinder shape with clear glass, providing a direct view of what was inside. A blue blur was going in circles, building up energy that was feeding the entire building. So that's the arc reactor, Tony said in awe. It seems you are really fascinated by this, Tony, Howard said with a smile. Tony nodded as they walked forward. Why is it so large? Howard let out a sigh. A good question, Tony. A very good question. I've tried to miniaturize the arc reactor before, but it has always ended in failure. I'm going to do it. Tony said, his hand unconsciously gripping his mother's hand. Howard looked at Tony in surprise and amusement, but then saw his serious expression and how his eyes never left the arc reactor. Instead of being amused, Howard smiled, giving Tony a nod of approval. He ruffled his hair. If I can't accomplish it, then it is your job to finish it. The arc reactor is and will be our greatest legacy. You are smart, Tony, smarter than I was at your age. For crying out loud, you're four years old, and instead of playing with toys, you spend your days studying. So if anyone can do it, it's you. Howard then went on to explain how the arc reactor worked. The arc reactor operates on the principle of clean and virtually limitless energy production. At its core, it's a fusion reactor similar to the sun but on a much smaller scale. The blue blur you see is plasma, a state of matter where gases are superheated to the point where atoms split apart into ions and electrons, this plasma is contained within a magnetic field, spinning rapidly to generate enormous amounts of energy. The glass cylinder allows us to observe the plasma, ensuring everything functions correctly. The energy created is then harnessed through a series of electromagnetic coils, which convert the energy into electricity that powers the entire building. The blue glow is actually the light emitted by the plasma and the energy it releases. The scientists and bodyguards looked at Howard oddly as they saw him explaining it to a four-year-old boy, who nodded along as if he understood. Howard then started to introduce everyone to Tony, who was still looking at the arc reactor with a fiery intensity. He gave half-hearted hellos and greetings, not paying attention to their names. After everything was set and done, they started to leave. So, honey... Did you have fun? Maria asked, holding his hand. Tony nodded. It was all so interesting. It's got me motivated to start inventing things on my own. Maria giggled as she ruffled his hair. Tony then looked at his father. So, old man, how long will it take for you to make me my lab? Howard pondered the question. At most a week. Hearing this, Tony released a sigh. An entire week? Do you even love me? He exaggerated. It usually takes a month, you know. We can make it that long if you want to complain. You know what, a week sounds so reasonable. I know I'm your favorite, Dad. But you don't have to spoil me so, Tony said, whistling to the side. Maria covered her mouth and let out a chuckle, while Howard shook his head in amusement. Howard then turned to Maria. You can take him home now. Now that I'm here, I'll take care of a few things before heading home. Maria nodded as the two kissed before going their separate ways. They arrived back at the limo, and Maria instructed Jarvis to drive them home, since her husband still had work to do. As the drive went on, Tony started to get tired from all the walking and exploring he did, so he proceeded to fall asleep on his mother's lap. Jarvis, drive slowly. Tony just fell asleep. Let's let him rest for a while, Maria said, moving Tony's hair from his face. The limo then slowed down as Tony went into a deep sleep. 
Third person's POV. I'm sorry to say, Mr. and Mrs. Stark, but your son is corkless, the doctor said. Howard and Maria Stark exchanged looks of disbelief. Maria covered her mouth in surprise. Shocker, Tony said sarcastically, rolling his eyes as he sat between them. The doctor glanced at Tony with surprise, expecting the boy to start crying. As most children did upon hearing, they wouldn't develop a quirk. You were expecting this, Tony? Howard asked, his voice tinged with concern. A bit, yeah. I mean, I've already been gifted with so much. If I was given any more, I'd be God's favorite child or something, Tony replied. They all looked at him in confusion, causing him to roll his eyes again. Come on, I'm like the cutest boy around, which means I have amazing good looks, I'm hella rich, and if people say that money can't buy happiness, it just means they're too poor to know. I have good parents, and not to mention the most amazing gift I do have, this, Tony pointed to his head. Maria and Howard began to smile, understanding his point. His genius was a superpower in itself. Mr. and Mrs. Stark, I'm afraid your child is suffering from a mental breakdown and is using narcissism to cope, the doctor said. I'm not having a mental breakdown, you quack, Tony said, glaring at the doctor. So anyway, now that this is over with, can we go home? You two took me away from my research. Time is a precious resource. People, he clapped his hands for emphasis. Wait, there's a reason why you're corkless, the doctor started to say, but Tony waved him off and stood up. Yeah, yeah, I already said why. When God was making me, he ran out of perk slots and couldn't add quirks. So, can we go now? He asked his parents. Howard and Maria chuckled at Tony's attitude and the shocked expression on the doctor's face. Yeah, we can go now, Howard said, standing up and shaking the doctor's hand in farewell. As they arrived back at their limo, Maria still looked at Tony with concern. Tony, are you sure you're all right? Tony grinned mischievously. Then, noticing their looks, he quickly changed his expression and pretended to cry. Boo-hoo! Whatever am I going to do? I don't have a quirk. Boo-hoo, the only way to make me feel better is if you buy me more things for my lab. Boo-hoo! He peeked through his fingers to see their reactions. They stared back at him with straight faces. Wah! I don't have any quirk. What am I going to do with my life? My life has no meaning without a quirk. Tony continued his exaggerated performance. Howard sighed. All right, Tony, we get it. We'll get you more stuff for your lab. Yes. Tony pumped his fist triumphantly. Seeing his parents still looking at him seriously, he wiped the corners of his eyes. I mean, sniff thank you. Thank you, you guys are the best. It didn't take long for them to arrive back home. As soon as they did, Tony rushed towards his lab. It had been a year since it was created and it had become his sanctuary. Tony sat down on a leather chair in front of a large monitor, his little fingers flying over the keyboard. I think a whole year is well enough time. It's time to be born, F-R-I-D-A-Y. Let's run one final check and add the last piece of the coding. Tony sat in his sleek, glass-walled lab, surrounded by an array of monitors displaying streams of code and intricate schematics. His fingers danced over the keyboard with a blend of urgency and precision, the hum of the servers providing a rhythmic backdrop to his work. The room was dimly lit, save for the glow of the screens. He leaned back in his chair, taking a moment to survey his progress. On the largest monitor, lines of complex algorithms scrolled rapidly, each one a testament to weeks of intense labor. His creation and advanced AI design to assist in his myriad projects was nearly complete. Tony's eyes flickered with a mix of excitement and determination as he prepared to finalize his masterpiece. Let's run one final check and add the last piece of the coding, Tony said, his voice steady yet tinged with anticipation. He typed a series of commands, initiating a thorough systems diagnostic. The AI's interface began to pulse with a soft, blue light as the check commenced. He watched intently as the diagnostic progressed, his mind racing through the possible scenarios. The screen displayed a comprehensive analysis of the AI's core functionalities, data processing, decision-making algorithms, and neural network integrations. Each section reported back with a green indicator, signaling all systems were optimal. Good, Tony muttered to himself, 
a small smile playing at the corners of his lips. He took a deep breath, feeling a rush of adrenaline. This was it, the culmination of countless hours of work, the fusion of cutting-edge technology and his own genius. Tony opened the final script, a dense block of code that would integrate the AI's autonomous learning capabilities. He carefully reviewed each line, ensuring there were no errors or redundancies. Satisfied, he typed the last command, his fingers moving with confident precision. Now, let's see if you're ready to come to life, Tony said softly, hitting the enter key. The room seemed to hold its breath as the code compiled and executed. The AI's interface glowed brighter, and the screens filled with dynamic data streams, indicating the AI was activating and initializing its processes. For a moment, there was silence. Then, a calm, articulate voice filled the room. Initialization complete. All systems are operational. How can I assist you, Tony? Tony couldn't help but grin. He had done it. His AI was alive, fully functional, and ready to take on the challenges he would throw its way. Leaning back in his chair, Tony allowed himself a brief moment of triumph. Then, unable to contain his excitement, he jumped up from his seat and started dancing around his lab, singing, I did it, I did it, I did it. He swung his arms out before rolling back again. Cough Tony did a slow turn and saw Jarvis standing by the door, looking at him with amusement. Don't mind me, young master. I'm just clearing my throat. You can go back to what you were doing. Tony stood there, a bit embarrassed, before shaking his head. He wasn't going to let that stop him from celebrating. Hey Jarvis, guess what? Jarvis raised a brow, waiting for him to continue. Tony pointed to himself with his thumbs. Guess who has two thumbs and invented an AI? Tony shook his thumbs to himself as he flexed. This guy, F-R-I-D-A-Y, introduce yourself to Jarvis. Tony said smugly. Good afternoon, Edwin Jarvis. I am F-R-I-D-A-Y, female replacement intelligent digital assistant youth. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, a female robotic voice said. Ah, uh, hello. Friday, Jarvis said, not knowing what to say since it had just used his full name. Jarvis sighed. Young master, you've really outdone yourself. Tony continued to look smug. I know, I know. Praise me more. You are amazing, master. You are fantastic. You are phenomenal, F-R-I-D-A-Y continued to praise in her robotic voice, making Tony puff his chest with pride. Third person's POV. Fire. Fire. Jarvis. Help. Tony screamed as he ran around his lab. Jarvis appeared with a fire extinguisher and quickly put out the flames on Tony's workstation. Tony coughed and patted Jarvis on the back. Jarvis. What would I do without you? Killed yourself, Jarvis said with a tired look. Most likely, Tony nodded in agreement. Friday, how many failures was that? Jarvis asked. 151, the robotic female voice answered. Young master, how are you not discouraged already? Any seven-year-old I know would have thrown a temper tantrum and given up by now. Tony looked at Jarvis weirdly and backed away slightly. You know other seven-year-olds apart from me? Why are you meeting them? Jarvis maintained a straight face and turned back towards the door. I'm leaving. No, 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 Jarvis, I'm only kidding. Come on, my guy, you know I was only kidding. Plus, you know I can't be here without you. And the reason I'm not giving up is simple. The road to success is built upon the bricks of failure, as I always say. Each mistake I make just gets me closer and closer. Plus, the next one is it, the next one is when I complete it, I just know. I have everything ready already. Jarvis nodded. That is a very nice saying, young master. Thank you, Jarvis, Tony smiled. The door to his lab opened, and Howard appeared. Get ready, Tony. We're going to a party. Party? What party? Tony tilted his head in confusion. A party thrown for David Shield. He has won a Nobel Prize. And since we are collaborators, we have to be there to show our support. Ah, uh, all right, Tony gave him a thumbs up. I'll go get ready then, old man. Howard nodded and exited the lab while Jarvis looked at Tony weirdly. What? Tony asked. I would have just expected you to throw a hissy fit or something. Tony rolled his eyes. Dad has already given me so much. 
It would be wrong of me to start complaining when he asks for something in return. Even if it's small, Jarvis looked surprised and put a hand over Tony's head. What are you doing? Checking to see if you're sick. That was surprisingly mature of you, young master. Tony gave him a plain look and smacked his hands away. I hate you. Jarvis just smiled. I love you as well, young master. Tony rolled his eyes again and walked away to get ready. Friday, power saver mode on. Everything dimmed, and Tony got dressed in a little tuxedo with a black bow tie and black sunglasses. He licked his finger, ran it through his eyebrows, and finger gunned the mirror. Oh yeah, baby, you still got it, he said with a charming smile. Maria walked in and blinked at Tony's actions. What are you doing? What do you think, my beautiful mother? Admiring God's greatest creation. I really need to get you checked to see if you really do have a case of narcissism, Maria teased. Now come on. Jarvis is waiting with the car outside. Don't miss me too much. Tony told his reflection with a snap of his fingers. Maria couldn't help but laugh. How do you even come up with these things, Tony? Hee hee. They soon walked out and got into the limo while Maria was still laughing at what she had witnessed. What's so funny? Howard asked curiously. You should have seen Tony in the mirror just now. Maria recounted the scene, which earned a chuckle from Howard. So, Dad, are you and this David Shield guy close? Tony asked. Very. We went to the same hero school together and had a bit of a friendly rivalry, Howard said with a reminiscent smile. We lost contact after he became the sidekick to Japan's number one S-class hero. It was only recently that he came back into the business side of things. Huh? This class? Tony asked, looking at Howard in confusion. I thought this was a My Hero Academia world? You haven't been doing your research, have you? I mean, I have, just not when it comes to heroes. I researched other academic things like science and physics. So again, an S-class hero. Howard sighed and began to explain. It first started with Japan. They were the first to implement the system of ranking heroes in something they called the Hero Association. The rankings went from C, B, A, and finally S-Class. At first, people took examinations and were placed in their appropriate rankings. They would go up in ranks due to their deeds and popularity among people. The higher the rank, the more money they were paid. Thus, more and more people started to apply. The other countries, seeing the success of what Japan was doing, started doing the same. They built their own associations funded by the government itself. To further motivate heroes around the world, all nations hold an event named the World Conference every 10 years, where they show off the achievements of their S-Class heroes. The five with the most achievements in the world gain the title of World Hero. Whoa, that actually sounds cool. I see how they would use that to motivate people to become heroes, Tony said, a bit impressed. Howard smiled as he continued. The hero David worked with is one of the best heroes in the world. All Might. He gained the title of world hero for three decades in a row. It's said that he has brought a long state of peace to Japan. He has become some sort of symbol from where he's from. He's known as the symbol of peace. Well, that's awful, Tony sighed, shaking his head. Maria and Howard looked at him in surprise, expecting him to be excited or have some sort of admiration. Why is it awful? Howard asked curiously. Maria was also curious and waited for an answer. Even Jarvis, who was driving them, was listening in. Just imagine the chaos that would ensue when that symbol crumbles or retires. Once they lose that sense of security, villains will lose the shackles that kept them in place. Everyone and everything would go wild. All three looked surprised by what Tony was implying. Howard stroked his chin and nodded thoughtfully. I see what you're trying to say. And you do have a point. So what are you going to do about it? What? Tony asked, looking at Howard weirdly. It seems to me you truly understand what being a hero means. So I'm curious if you have a plan to fix the situation. Howard said with a smile. You're asking the corkless boy if he has a solution for a problem relating to heroes? Tony asked, staring at Howard as if he had lost his mind. Humor me, Tony. Howard continued to smile. I know that being corkless doesn't stop you. You've never once viewed your status as corkless as a weakness that shackles you and stops you from reaching your dreams. So I ask you again, 
What would be your solution? Tony sighed and leaned back. I guess I'll do the thing I'm best at. I'll build something that can't crumble, that can't be stopped, that can continue even after I'm dead. Something that would be passed on to my kid and the next. Howard let out a hearty laugh while Maria looked at Tony with a soft smile. Even Jarvis at the wheel had a proud look. Howard patted Tony's head and nodded. I know you can do it, son. Yeah, I'm not being a hero. That seems like trouble that puts the people I love at risk. So I'd rather just keep inventing. Howard and Maria kept smiling. Their expressions clearly indicating they didn't believe him. Yeah, think what you want. I'm not being a hero, Tony said as he fixed his hair. The limo began to slow down as they approached a large house. It wasn't quite a mansion, but it wasn't modest either. Other cars were pulling up, and people in fancy clothing and dresses were entering. They then heard Jarvis' voice over the intercom. Master, we have arrived, he said as the car stopped. Jarvis then came around and opened the door for them. Tony was the first to step out. He took his glasses from his shirt and put them on, walking with a swagger as Howard offered Maria a hand. They both exited the car and followed Tony. Third person's POV. Tony continued to walk with a swagger, Maria and Howard exchanging amused glances at his antics. Even Jarvis shook his head in exasperation as he went to park the car and join them later. Come on, Tony. Let's go meet David. I heard he has a daughter around your age. I think it's finally time you make a friend, Howard said in a playful tone. Oh, that sounds like a wonderful idea, Maria agreed. Equally playful. Har har har. You guys are absolutely hilarious. And for your information, I do have a best friend. Jarvis is our butler. He doesn't count, Howard said plainly. Jarvis will be hurt by that statement. Hashtag butler lives matter, Tony said as they entered. Howard just sighed and shook his head. Maria grabbed Tony's hand so he wouldn't get lost, knowing how he tended to wander when bored. Ah, I see David, Howard said, leading them toward a man with slick brown hair, wearing a suit and black framed glasses, talking with some people. A little blonde girl in a blue dress stood nearby, looking bored. As he lives and breathes, if it isn't Davy, Howard said. David looked up and broke into a wide smile upon seeing Howard. Howie, you haven't changed a bit. They shook hands and hugged, patting each other on the back and laughing. David then turned to Maria and they exchanged side kisses before hugging. Maria, it's so good to see you. It's good to see you again as well, David, Maria said. David then turned to Tony. And who's this little guy? This is my son too. Howard was cut off as Tony stepped forward and offered his hand. The name's Anthony Stark. I am pleased to make your acquaintance. David Shield, David said, shaking his hand with amusement. I must say, congratulations on winning the Nobel Prize. Such a feat isn't an easy thing to do, Tony said as they disengaged from the handshake. Thank you, David replied, looking at Howard in confusion. Ah, let me introduce you to... David was cut short as Tony stepped toward the little blonde girl. The name Stark, Anthony Stark. May I have the honor of knowing your name, he asked, offering his hand. Melissa Shield, the little girl said a bit shyly as she offered her hand in return. Tony simply took it and kissed the back of her hand. A lovely name for a lovely mademoiselle, he said, smiling charmingly as his glasses slid down his nose a bit, giving her a wink. Melissa turned bright red and looked down, steam practically coming out of her head. David looked at Howard with a placated expression. I see the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Please tell your son to stop flirting with my daughter. Tony, Maria chastised. Yes, mother dearest? Tony asked in confusion. Howard had an awkward expression. Sorry about him. It seems he has a severe case of narcissism with no cure. Like I said, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, David said with a sigh. It appears you created a carbon copy of yourself. Wait, I just understood why people say that. Humans are mostly made of carbon, so a carbon copy would be an exact replica. Ha, the more you know, Tony said with a finger on his chin. Melissa, who had recovered from her embarrassment, had a shocked look. Oh wow, you're right. I didn't even think of that. I know, right? Me either. 
It just came to me just now. Crazy, right? Tony nodded while Melissa nodded back. It seems like they're going to get along perfectly fine, Maria said with a smile. Howard looked teasingly at David. It looks like we're going to become in-laws soon enough. Eh, Davy, please don't joke about my daughter. You're about to give me a heart attack. Maria crouched down to Melissa's level. Your name is Melissa, right? Please be a dear and show my son around. He doesn't really know how to make friends. Okay, Melissa said cheerfully. She grabbed Tony's wrist and started to drag him around. Come, I'll show you around and where the other kids are, she said sadly. Why the sad smile? Tony asked as he was being dragged along. Ah, it's nothing. Don't worry about it, Melissa said, shaking her head. It's clearly not nothing if you're all frowny. How am I supposed to enjoy the tour if my tour guide is sad? Melissa let out a little sigh. Well, when I introduce you to the others, you'll probably want to hang out with them and not with me. And why would I do that? Tony asked, looking at her in confusion. You'll see, was all Melissa said as she brought Tony toward where all the other kids were talking and showing off their quirks, laughing among themselves. Hey, Melissa said with a fake cheery smile. Look, I brought someone else. His name is Anthony Stark. Stark as in Stark Industries? One of the older kids, around 10 years old, said in surprise. He had deer antlers growing out of his head and soon developed an arrogant smirk as he walked toward Tony. The name's Harris. Let's become good friends, best friends even, he said, extending his hand. Here's a piece of advice as your new friend. Don't hang out with that corkless loser over there. You wouldn't want to catch her disease, he said in a joking manner, which caused the kids around them to start laughing loudly. Melissa put her head down with a sad look, holding her blue dress as tears gathered in her eyes, trying hard not to cry. Tony just looked at Harris's hand before looking up, not bothering to shake it. Melissa, you're a terrible tour guide. What? Melissa said in a sadder voice. You're supposed to show me the good part of the party, not the trash. They all had a look of shock. Even Melissa had a stunned expression. The arrogant smile on Harris's face faltered. What? He asked in confusion. Hey dipshit, I'm corkless as well. They all looked toward Tony with a hint of disgust while Harris slowly lowered his hand. He couldn't really do anything as Tony was from the richest company in the world. Harris could only scoff. Wow, two corkless losers. You two were practically made for each other. Tony sighed. You just had to open your mouth. Tony didn't hesitate as he punched Harris in the mouth, causing Harris to stagger back and hold his mouth in surprise. Ow, he cried, with tears gathering in his eyes. The kids looked toward Tony in horror. When Harris looked down at his hand and saw blood, he began to cry out loud. You punched me. His tears then turned to tears of anger as he charged toward Tony with his antlers. Some corkless nobody isn't going to get away with that. Tony simply stepped to the side and stuck his leg out, causing Harris to trip and roll on the ground. Harris then held his face as he began to cry even louder. Tony looked toward the others. You guys want some as well? They all shook their heads. Hearing the commotion, adults came running. They gasped in horror seeing Harris bleeding and crying while the other kids looked at Tony fearfully. Make way! They heard David's voice, so they parted. David came running through with Howard and Maria in tow. Seeing how the kids looked at Tony with fear, Howard and Maria sighed. Tony, again? Didn't you promise to stop this? David looked toward them in surprise. Tony didn't look the least bit remorseful. They were making fun of her and making her cry. You know I don't do this unprovoked. Tony, Howard sighed. Melissa then came to his defense. He's right, he was just protecting me because they called me a corkless loser. David nodded his head, then turned toward Tony. Thank you for looking after my daughter, but please don't resort to violence. I can't promise that. If they get on my nerves, I'm gonna punch them. Tony shrugged before walking off. Come on, princess, you owe me a tour. But before he walked off, he turned toward his father. He called us both corkless losers that were made for each other. Please take care of it, father. My poor feelings were hurt. Howard only scoffed before nodding his head. Tony then turned back, 
seeing his father confirm it, and walked away with a blushing Melissa following close behind. Third person's POV. Melissa looked at Tony shyly as she asked, Why did you call me a princess? Because you're wearing a shiny blue dress and have blonde hair. When someone mentions a princess, blonde hair and a blue or pink dress come to mind. I see. So are you really quirkless? I'm too great to have a quirk, Tony casually said. Melissa looked at Tony in confusion. Ha! Huh. Tony just looked at Melissa with a smile. We were born with so many wonderful gifts that our bodies didn't have any more room for quirks. Melissa let out a chuckle hearing that. That's the first time I'm hearing that. Did you make that up? Nope. It's just a scientifically proven fact, Tony said confidently. Huh? Where did you read that? It's scientific research I did using myself as the base. You need more than one test subject to make a hypothesis like that, Melissa chuckled again. See, you know about the scientific method, which means you're way smarter than people your age. Which also means you're too smart for a quirk. That makes two for two, Tony said, patting his chest with pride. Tony then held out his hand high for a high five. Here, Melissa only stared at Tony in confusion. You haven't seen a high five before? Tony asked. I have. I just don't know the reason Melissa said. Isn't it obvious I'm welcoming you into our little corkless club? Melissa giggled upon hearing that. Tony then motioned his hand. Come on now. Don't leave me hanging. Melissa gave Tony the high five as Tony then nodded. To being corkless. Melissa continued to laugh. To being corkless, she repeated, Hey, Anthony, call me Tony. Only strangers and people I don't really like have to call me Anthony. Does that mean we're friends? Melissa said with an excited expression. You're being way too excited, girly, Tony said. Melissa started pressing her index fingers together. Sorry, I just haven't had a friend before. Whoa, was all Tony managed to say, as he didn't know what else he was supposed to say. What did your parents mean when they asked again? Do you usually beat up people? Melissa asked curiously. A bit. When I first started school, people quickly found out I was quirkless and started bullying me. And me... Being the great person that I am obviously fought back. But isn't that bad? Melissa asked. Tony slowly turned to look at her. You're kidding, right? Melissa only looked at Tony in confusion. Hurting people is something only villains do. Oh my god, you can't be serious, Tony asked. Seeing her confused expression, he sighed. So what? I'm just supposed to keep getting bullied and picked on my whole life? Melissa shook her head. You get an adult or someone older to help you out. You sweet, sweet, innocent child. Is that what you want your whole life to be? Having other people solve your problems for you? No. Melissa muttered. Tony nodded. We are quirkless. This world is full of power, villains, and heroes. In order for our voices to be heard, we have to scream the loudest. In order for our actions to be recognized, we have to put in twice the effort. People bully us because they think we can't defend ourselves because they think we'll amount to nothing. Do you know how we prove them wrong? Melissa shook her head while looking at Tony with expectation. We fight back. We make them think twice about messing with us. Tony then pointed up while lowering his glasses, looking at her. We, who are at the bottom of the barrel, have to get our own hands dirty to reach the top. So there is nothing villainous about having to get your hands dirty and fighting against what you believe is injustice and what you believe is right. Melissa had a look of fascination while he heard clapping behind him. Tony's expression grew plain as he turned and looked towards Jarvis, who was clapping his hands with a proud look. That was an amazing speech, young master. Absolutely amazing. I've been moved to tears, Jarvis said, grabbing a handkerchief from his side pocket and wiping his tears. Melissa looked at Jarvis oddly and leaned in to ask, Who is that? My obnoxious butler who seems to have forgotten his place, Tony replied. Jarvis knew Tony was only joking and just smiled. Whatever do you mean, young master? You know my place is always by your side. Protecting you? Yeah, yeah. Then protect me in silence far away from me, Tony said, shooing him away. Jarvis only chuckled. So who's your little lady friend? He asked looking towards Melissa. Melissa did a quick introduction. Hello, I'm Melissa Shield. Pleased to meet you. Ah, uh, I see you must be the host's daughter. 
Thank you for being friends with the young master, Jarvis said with a smile. Melissa only shyly nodded her head. Jarvis then turned towards Tony. Congrats, young master. Now you have another friend besides me. You really have no tact for a butler, Jarvis, Tony said, shaking his head before turning towards Melissa. Weren't you going to show me around? Last time you took me to a place full of trash. Please let the next place be more pleasant. Melissa smiled and nodded her head. Come, I'll show you around some more, she said, grabbing his arm and dragging him along. She started showing him the different rooms around the house. She also showed him her room, which was filled with gadgets and advanced books that looked too advanced for her age. What are you making? Tony asked. Right now, I'm trying to make a pogo stick, but I'm having a bit of difficulty getting it to fit into a box form to make it easier to carry around. Have you thought about using Collapse Tech? Collapse Tech. Collapse Tech is a design concept that enables objects to transform into a more compact shape for easy storage and transport by using a series of interlocking segments that can slide into each other or fold in an almost origami-like manner. This way, you can reduce it to a fraction of its operational size without compromising its functionality or strength. I see. That's really interesting. I haven't really thought about that. Melissa nodded her head. You should come to my lab then. You'll see more amazing things, Tony said with a proud smirk. You have a lab? Melissa asked a little jealous. Sure do. Crash, they all heard the sound of multiple windows breaking. Even the windows in Melissa's room shattered as someone burst through them, wearing a black Kevlar mask. All of his fingers had some type of circular metal attached to them. Tony put his body in front of Melissa to shield her from the flying glass shards. Look who we have here, if it isn't the target, the masked man smirked. He aimed his fingers towards them, and they started to give off a red light as if charging. Jarvis ran in front of Tony and Melissa and kicked the man's hand upwards, causing red laser bullets to escape his fingers and hit the ceiling. Jarvis got into a boxing stance and started punching the man in the stomach before punching him in the face, causing him to stagger back. The man aimed his fingers towards Jarvis and charged up an attack, but Jarvis, without hesitation, grabbed his hand and twisted it, dropping the man to the floor. The man shot lasers from his other hand at Jarvis's foot, causing blood to escape. Jarvis winced before twisting the hand harder. Arg! The man screamed as he heard his arm crack. With his other hand, he punched Jarvis in the stomach and tried to shoot him there as well. Jarvis tried to grab that hand too, but the man used the opportunity to escape from Jarvis's grasp. He tried to step back, but Jarvis stepped on his foot with his bleeding one and held him in place, continuing to punch him in the face until blood painted the bottom half of the black mask red. Jarvis then grabbed him when he tried to retaliate and flung him out the window. As he flew out, he was upside down with a scary expression in his eyes. If I'm going down, I'm taking all of them with me. He thought before aiming all of his fingers towards Tony and Melissa and shooting lasers that flew at rapid speed. Jarvis, seeing this, jumped and covered their little bodies with his. Just like how I wanted it, he thought as he fell to the floor. Tony stared with widened eyes, unable to believe what he was seeing. Jarvis's body had multiple holes, with blood leaking from them. Jarvis looked towards Tony with a smile as blood escaped his lips. You're safe. I'm glad. He managed to say as he slid off their bodies and fell to the floor with blood pooling everywhere. Jarvis. Tony asked, his hands shaking and his eyes still wide. Third person's POV. No, 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 no. Tony kept repeating as he knelt down towards Jarvis. This can't be happening. Not you, Jarvis. Not to you. Please. Tony pleaded, trying to cover the holes in Jarvis's body to keep his blood from escaping. I'm afraid so, young master. You'll have to forgive me. It looks like I'll have to resign shortly. Tears streamed down Tony's face as he clung to Jarvis. Please, Jarvis. You yourself said that I'd be killed without you. I need you. Tony continued to cry and plead. Blood escaped from Jarvis's mouth as he let out a cough, staining Tony's cheek. Jarvis shakily lifted his hand and wiped the blood off Tony's cheek. Young master, I'm afraid I'll have to go early, but I want you to promise me something, Jarvis said hurriedly knowing his time was running out. 
Tony just continued to cry as he clung to Jarvis. What is it, Jarvis? Jarvis took a gulp, but just ended up coughing more blood. I've seen what you're planning. I was with you for a long time, so I know how incredibly smart and talented you are. So, I want you to do it. Please become this world's greatest hero. If anyone in this world can do it, it's you. Tears streamed down Jarvis's face as he felt his life slipping from his grasp with every breath he took. He knew that the next breath he took would be his last. And so, with all his willpower, Jarvis gave Tony his final words. Tony, you are too mature for your age. You understand problems that normal people wouldn't. So, I know you can do it. I have not a single doubt in my mind that you will be an amazing. Jarvis didn't manage to say the last word as his eyes closed and his head dropped to the side. Jarvis? Tony softly asked. Jarvis? No. Please. Tears streamed uncontrollably down Tony's face as he continued to cry and sob, hugging Jarvis's lifeless body. Tears also began to stream down Melissa's cheeks as she stared in horror. More masked men, all wearing different masks, appeared as they heard the commotion. Their smiles grew as they saw Tony. Heh. Look boys, we hit the jackpot. Two men took out bags, and as Melissa turned around, they put a bag over her head and lifted her off the ground, causing her to scream and kick, but they sealed the bag with her inside. When Tony looked back, hearing the commotion, he saw green smoke rising up from behind them as they put him in a bag as well. No matter how much they kicked and called for help, no help came. Tony heard one of them say, the sleeping gas should last a good 30 minutes. Let's leave quickly before the police get here. Tony just felt himself being moved around, causing him to grit his teeth with hate. The man he considered his best friend had just been murdered, and he hadn't had the time to mourn due to his kidnapping. And that reminder brought a wave of sadness over Tony. He tried to calm himself. Friday, are you there? Tony whispered. How may I be of assistance, master? Tony heard Friday say as a screen appeared in his glasses. I'm being kidnapped. Be sure to keep track of my location and send it to the police, the heroes, and my parents when they wake up. It shall be done, Friday replied. Tony then felt himself being thrown, smashing against what he believed was the back of a truck. He then heard the sound of Melissa's cries as she was also thrown next to him. Melissa, can you hear me? Tony asked out loud. Tony, is that really you? I'm scared. What's going on? Melissa continued to cry. It appears we have been kidnapped. Tony then heard someone scoff in amusement. And it appears we have company. So what is it that you want? Money? Because if it's money, I have billions for pocket change. Tony then felt himself being kicked in the stomach. Ugh. A simple no would have sufficed, you know. You know if the merchandise gets damaged, the ransom decreases. Liam, stop it, he's right. We can't have anything happen to him. The boss wouldn't like it, another male voice said. Right? But I just couldn't help it. He's talking to us like we're merely peasants. Oh, so you are all working for someone. Liam, you should keep that guy's mouth shut before he spills out anything else, Tony said, acting like they were all buddy-buddy. Tony then felt another kick, causing him to start coughing. Terry, sorry, sorry, but you're right. He's annoying. Let's see if we can get some tape. I'll keep quiet, no tape, please, Tony said quickly. Tony, are you alright? Melissa asked worriedly. Never been better, Tony replied sarcastically. In a nearby police station, monitors suddenly started flashing warning signs. Even in the commissioner's office, the computer was flashing. Anthony Stark is currently kidnapped. After the warning, a video from security cameras showed men wearing masks carrying two bags that were kicking around and then throwing them into the back of a black van before driving off. The commissioner, a burly man with red hair and a thick red beard, stood up from his seat and looked at the screen in surprise. The door to his office opened. Commissioner Ramsey, sir, you're going to want to come and see this, a black-haired man wearing a police uniform said. Is it about the kidnapping of Anthony Stark? The police officer was surprised but nodded. Are you seeing this too, sir? Ramsey turned his monitor towards the officer. I take it this is happening on everyone's screen? 
Ramsey asked. The officer just nodded his head. That's not all, sir. We've been receiving calls that even heroes are getting this. I see. Stark. Huh. That must be their child that was kidnapped. But what has occurred to them? Ramsey asked. The screen then changed as if answering his question. They are in the S.H.I.E.L.D. residence. Unconscious due to sleeping gas. It then showed the outside of David Shield's residence, with green smoke escaping from its shattered windows. Who are you? Ramsey asked. The words then changed to two words, Anthony Stark, causing his eyes to widen. Ramsey then looked towards the officer in front of him, grabbed his police jacket from his chair, and put it on. I need you to gather two separate squadrons. One needs to go to the S.H.I.E.L.D. residence, and the other one to follow that vehicle. But that one needs to be stealthy. We'll keep a safe distance behind and let them get to their destination first. Come on, people, move it, Ramsey ordered with authority. If anything happens to anyone named Stark, it will be our heads on the line. Everyone started to move immediately. They all rushed towards their cop cars and went in two separate directions. The heroes weren't any different, but their reasons for action varied. Some were motivated by greed, thinking, if we could get the Starks to be indebted to us, we'd be set for life, but not all the heroes were like that. Some were truly selfless and wanted to help because the life of a child was in danger. Third person's POV. Tony felt the vehicle suddenly stop. He thought it was another red light, but then he felt the engine turn off. He was then picked up and slung over someone's shoulder. Whoa! Melissa yelped in surprise. Where are you taking us? She asked nervously. To meet the boss, obviously, Liam answered. Tony, still with a bag over his head, just felt himself being carried. He could have watched himself from a third-person perspective, but the area they were bringing him to didn't have any cameras nearby. After a while and many twists and turns, Tony felt himself being sat down and tied up with rope. The bag over his head was then removed. Melissa's bag was removed as well. They sat back to back, tied to their chairs. Melissa had to look away due to the sudden light, but Tony wasn't bothered. He looked around, and his glasses locked onto faces, pulling up information on their quirks and criminal records. So which one of you is Liam, and which one of you is Terry? I'd like to make a formal complaint about how I was treated on the ride here, Tony said. If you have any formal complaints, be sure to take them up with me. An amused deep voice responded. Who's me, you dumbass? My back is turned toward you, and I can't exactly turn around, Tony said, irritated. Tony, please stop antagonizing them, Melissa pleaded in a scared tone. The man who spoke had black hair and glasses. He wore a burgundy business suit and had a glass of whiskey on his desk. He looked toward one of his men and twirled his finger around. A man with dark blue hair, who looked to be in his early twenties, picked up the chair and turned them around. You better listen to the little lady, boy. Antagonizing me isn't in your best interest, the man said. So you're the boss. What do you want? Money? Like I told Liam, I have plenty, Tony said with a straight face. The man grabbed his whiskey and twirled it slightly before drinking it. Really? Intimidation tactics on a child, Tony said plainly. The man chuckled as he put the empty glass down. I'm afraid money isn't what I'm after. Since you're in a family business, you know money comes and goes. No, I need something else. Sorry, I don't deal in prostitution. I don't sell my body to anyone. The boss heard someone snicker, causing him to shatter the glass with his fist. The name is Hammerfist and I used to be one of your dear old dad's employees, so I know firsthand how incredibly smart he is. You'll be used as a ransom, all right, but not for money, for power. I will make him create a weapon strong enough to threaten any hero and villain alike, making me the kingpin of the underworld. And if he doesn't comply, your life is forfeit, along with the little missy here, who is an added bonus. My uncle is all might, you know? Melissa suddenly said in desperation. Once he learns what happened to me, he will come flying faster than a plane to save me. Hammerfist scoffed. I don't have time for your lies, little girl. Cover her mouth, he ordered. She isn't lying, Tony said plainly. Hammerfist looked at him with a raised brow as Tony continued. You should really look at who you kidnapped first. 
That is Melissa Shield, daughter of David Shield, whose party we were just at. And everyone in the United States knows that David Shield used to work for All Might. The reason Tony was doing all this talking was that his glasses were warning him of someone fast approaching. Hammerfist scoffed again, but before he could finish, they heard someone behind the door. New order. The air around Anthony Stark create a barrier to protect him, the voice commanded. The air around Tony suddenly shifted, creating a bubble around him. Due to their close proximity, Melissa was also protected. The door was then suddenly punched open, causing Hammerfist to click his tongue. His figure shifted as he was suddenly covered in a rock-like armor, resembling the thing from Marvel. I don't know how you found us so quickly, but I'll make sure you don't get out of here, Hammerfist said, rushing toward Stars and Stripes. He went to punch her, but she blocked it with her palm, catching him by surprise. While Hammerfist was busy with Stars and Stripes, his men were trying to break the barrier to use Tony and Melissa as hostages. His name is Irvin Patrick, Tony said, looking at Stars and Stripes. She smiled and nodded before looking at Hammerfist. New order. Irvin Patrick is unable to use his quirk. The rocks around him crumbled as he looked at himself in surprise. Before he could retaliate, Stars and Stripes knocked him out with a single punch. New order. I'm super fast. She then smiled, turning into a blur and running around, knocking out everyone else in the room. When she punched the last one, he went flying back and ended up embedded in the wall, unconscious. Cancel new order, stars and stripes commanded. The barrier surrounding Tony and Melissa vanished, and she untied them. Thank you, Melissa said with a large smile and a look of deep admiration. Tony, however, looked at her quizzically. Why would the number one hero come to personally save us? Aren't you more of a military hero? She chuckled. Let's just say your father has a very close connection with the military and is highly respected among them. So tell me, boy, how did you do it? How did you warn the police and the heroes that you were kidnapped if you were, well, kidnapped, she asked. Melissa, hearing this, looked at Tony in surprise. Did you really? Stars and stripes nodded. It was one of the reasons I was able to find you guys so quickly. Tony tapped his glasses. I don't wear these just to look cool, you know? I see, she said with a smile. It looks like you inherited your father's smarts. Don't patronize me, Tony said, walking away. Stars and Stripes had an awkward smile as she watched him leave, with Melissa following after him. You were able to warn the heroes and get us help. You're amazing, Tony, Melissa said in awe. I know, he said arrogantly. So how do the glasses work? She asked, curiosity burning in her eyes. Friday, I'm giving her access, Tony said as he handed the glasses to Melissa. Melissa put them on and held the sides as she looked around. Minimum clearance level towards Melissa Shield activated. How may I be of your assistance, Melissa Shield? She heard Friday ask. Whoa, who's that? She asked. I am F-R-I-D-A-Y. Tony Stark's personally crafted AI that helps him with his needs. You made an A.I? Melissa asked in amazement. You said you have a lab, right? You have to let me come and see it, Melissa said in a begging tone. She took Tony's hand and pleaded. Pretty please. Fine, but only if you promise to be my lab assistant, Tony said. His smile then grew a bit sad. I'm in need of one after all. Melissa nodded her head. I'll be the best assistant ever, she declared. They soon found themselves outside with police cars parked everywhere and Howard, Maria, and David all waiting for them. Tony, Howard and Maria yelled. Melissa, David yelled. Seeing her dad, all the emotions Melissa had been suppressing came flooding back. Tears flowed from her eyes as she clung to her dad. Daddy, I was scared. Tony surprisingly wasn't any different. As soon as Maria and Howard knelt down and hugged him, he broke down. Dad, Mom, Jarvis, he gave his life for me, Tony sobbed. We know, baby, we know, Maria said, tears in her eyes. And I couldn't be more grateful to him, Howard said, tears in his eyes as well. After all, Jarvis had been with him for a very long time. Tony's heart-wrenching sobs caused them to break down as well. Even when Tony was a baby, he didn't cry. 
Hearing him cry so much for Jarvis made them realize how much he was hurting over his death. Third person's POV. A few days after the event, there was a big funeral held for Jarvis, mostly with friends and family. There were many tears among everyone. Seeing all the people who came, Tony turned towards Howard. It appears Jarvis was very loved, he said. Howard smiled sadly as he nodded his head. Yes, he was. When he was in the military, he helped out everyone he could. Almost everyone who knew him had a sense of admiration for him, Howard said. Many people gave speeches about how Jarvis had helped them at some point in their lives, how they were forever indebted to him, and how he was a good friend and a great son. After the last person gave their speech, the pastor then asked, does anyone else have something to say before the end of the ceremony? Me. They heard the voice of a little kid. When they turned, they saw Tony with his hand raised and a note in hand. Everyone was a bit surprised as he stood up and walked towards the podium. Are you sure you want to do this, son? The priest asked. Tony nodded and walked in front of the podium. Do you guys have a booster seat? This is kind of tall for a kid my age. That earned him a chuckle amid their tears. I'm being serious. Can't you see I'm small? They soon got him a large stool to sit on so he could get close to the microphone on the podium. Honestly, I have many things to say. But first, let's start with the introduction. Hello, everyone. I am Anthony Ebe Stark. Jarvis was a butler who worked under my father for many years, to the point where they became very close friends. Since I was born, Jarvis has been a constant presence in my life. He has seen many of my firsts. My first steps, first words, first inventions, and many of my failures. Along the way, Jarvis became more than just a butler in my life. He became a friend, a best friend even. In this crazy world, we have many heroes to look up to. But to me, my number one hero will always be Jarvis. He saved my life in more ways than I can count. Tony paused and chuckled a bit. Funny thing is, before we left for the party, I made a joke asking where I would be without him. Without hesitation, he said I would have probably killed myself. Just to show how many times he saved me from my own hands, Tony then gripped the podium as he bit his lip. It truly isn't fair how Jarvis has left us. He was a good man. He gave up his life to save mine. He used his own body as a shield to make sure I was alright, and I will never forget it. I was with him in his last moments, his last breath, and he used that chance to tell me something. He told me he believed I could be a hero. Can you guys believe it? Me, a quirkless little kid. He used his last breath to tell me he had confidence that I could become a hero. Ha 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 ha. He laughed into the microphone, causing people to believe he had lost his mind. The priest went to grab him. I think that's enough, son, he said, putting a hand on his shoulder. Tony shrugged him off and grabbed the microphone again. Fine, Tony said, looking at everyone present. Since that's what he wanted, that's what I'll do. I'm using this chance to declare to Jarvis, who is watching over me, and to all of you who are here as witnesses, I, Anthony Stark, hereby declare that I will be this world's greatest hero anyone has ever seen. Think what you all like about my corkless status. I'll let my actions speak for themselves. Tony then grabbed his note from the podium and jumped off before walking towards his father. Although he felt all gazes on him, his movements never faltered. That was a fantastic speech, Tony, Howard said, patting his head with a proud smile. His mother gave him a hug as she nodded. Truly, it was wonderful. He then felt someone pat his shoulder from behind and found David Shield giving him a thumbs up in support while Melissa leaned forward. That was fantastic. You were so cool. When have I not been? Tony scoffed arrogantly. This caused Melissa to roll her eyes, as she was now getting familiar with Tony's narcissism. Soon after the speeches came the burial. Tony threw a bouquet of flowers as they started lowering the casket. Tears still fell from his eyes seeing this. After it was covered in dirt and he was properly buried, all that remained was a tombstone that read, an amazing friend but an even greater butler. Tony was seen sitting in a limo staring into the graveyard. He felt a hand on his and saw Melissa holding his hand with a worried look. I'm fine, he said, shaking his head. Is there any place you want to stop by, Tony? Maria asked, looking at Tony a little worriedly. 
Yes, home. I have something I need to complete. Tony nodded with a serious expression. Tony then turned towards Melissa. And you better change. I don't think you'll be of much help in a dress. Unless you want to dirty it. Tony, that's no way to talk to a lady, Maria chastised. What? She agreed to be my lab assistant. So her help will be needed, Tony said, shrugging his shoulders. That still doesn't give you the excuse to talk so rudely to people. Tony didn't want to argue with his mother. So he sighed. Yes, mother. They first dropped off Melissa and David before heading home. As he exited the limo, Tony said, Don't disturb me. I'm going to my lab and if Melissa arrives, send her there. No one else is allowed to enter. Maria just looked at Howard with worry. Howard put a hand on her shoulder. Don't worry. He's just very motivated right now and wants to do this. No, he needs to do this. For his own good. But still, Maria wanted to insist. But Howard gave her a side hug and kissed her on the cheek. I know, my love, I know. As Tony entered his lab, he took off his three-piece suit, leaving him only in a shirt. He rolled up the shirt sleeves and unbuttoned a few buttons at the top. Friday, commence attempt number 152. Welcome back, master. Now commencing project artificial heart. Attempt number 152. Third person's POV. It took Tony an hour to set everything up, from taking out and arranging the tools to getting the right elements in place. Friday, what was wrong with attempt number 151? Tony asked as he sat on his chair, twirling a stylus on his finger and looking at the large table with the image plans of a mini arc reactor. Attempt number 151 experienced a power fluctuation due to an instability in the energy modulation circuits. Friday responded. This caused an intermittent power output that could not be regulated effectively, leading to a failure in maintaining a consistent energy supply. Tony nodded, deep in thought as he reviewed the design. All right, let's focus on stabilizing those circuits for the next iteration. Friday, what elements are we using in the energy modulation circuits? Specifically, is palladium still a key component? Tony asked, leaning closer to the image plans on the table. Yes, Master, Friday replied. The energy modulation circuits currently utilize palladium as a primary element for its conductive properties. Additionally, the circuits incorporate an alloy of titanium and gold to enhance stability and durability. Tony frowned, tapping the stylus against the table. Could the palladium be causing the instability? Have we tested alternatives? We have tested alternatives, including rhodium and platinum, Friday answered. However, they did not provide the same level of efficiency as palladium. The instability seems to be related to the configuration rather than the materials themselves. Interesting, Tony mused. Let's run a simulation with a modified configuration. Try altering the arrangement of the energy modulation circuits and see if that improves stability. Understood, master. Running the simulation now, Friday responded, as the plans on the table began to update with the new configuration. Tony watched as the simulation ran, the plans on the table updating in real time. Friday, give me a status update. Everything appears to be in order, Friday responded. The energy modulation circuits are stable with the new configuration. Conductivity tests with palladium and the titanium gold alloy are all green. Thermal regulation is within acceptable limits. Magnetic field alignment is optimal. Structural integrity of the reactor casing is confirmed. Tony leaned back, feeling a small sense of relief. What's the one thing that's still in the red? The power distribution network is still experiencing a bottleneck. The conduits are not handling the peak loads efficiently, causing a delay in energy transfer. This bottleneck is the primary issue preventing the mini arc reactor from achieving full functionality. Tony's eyes narrowed as he focused on the highlighted section of the plans. All right, let's isolate that problem and find a solution. Once we fix the power distribution network, we'll have a working mini arc reactor. Tony stared at the highlighted section of the plans, his mind racing through possible solutions. Friday, let's focus on the power distribution network. What materials and configurations have we tested so far? 
We have primarily used standard copper conduits and a linear layout for the distribution network, Friday replied. Alternative materials such as superconducting alloys and graphene have also been tested, but with limited success, Tony tapped the stylus against the table, deep in thought. What if we switch to a radial distribution layout and use a high-temperature superconductor for the conduits? Something that can handle the peak loads more efficiently and reduce the delay in energy transfer. High-temperature superconductors could indeed improve efficiency, Friday acknowledged. A radial layout would also help distribute the load more evenly across the network. Shall I run a simulation with these changes? Yes, do it, Tony said, watching as the plans updated once again. The table displayed the new radial layout with high-temperature superconductor conduits. Simulation running, Friday reported. After a few moments, the AI continued, the new configuration shows a significant improvement in power distribution efficiency. The peak loads are now handled without delay, and the overall performance of the network is within optimal parameters. The bottleneck issue has been resolved. Tony grinned, feeling a rush of excitement. That's it, Friday. We finally cracked it. Implement the changes in the prototype and let's run a full systems test. Understood, master. Implementing the changes now, Friday responded as the plans finalized the adjustments. We are ready for the full systems test. Tony stood up, energized. Let's light this thing up. Tony Stark, only seven years old but already a prodigy in his own right, stood in the heart of his workshop, surrounded by an array of tools and materials meticulously organized around him. His eyes gleamed with determination as he prepared to embark on the ambitious task of building an arc reactor from scratch. Friday, let's begin, Tony said with a confidence beyond his years, addressing his AI assistant. The workshop buzzed with activity as the mechanical arms Tony had designed and built himself sprang into action. They fetched the raw materials Tony had meticulously gathered, palladium cores, titanium gold alloys, and the high-temperature superconducting materials he had researched extensively. Tony, wearing scaled-down safety gear that made him look even smaller but no less determined, carefully laid out the components on his workbench. With a steady hand, he started assembling the core structure of the arc reactor, referring to the detailed schematics he had drawn up with Friday's guidance. Friday, confirm the alignment of the palladium core, Tony instructed, his voice steady despite the excitement bubbling within him. Alignment confirmed. Master, Friday replied promptly. Proceeding with the next phase. Integrating the titanium gold alloy stabilizers. Tony nodded, focusing intently as he placed each stabilizer in its designated position around the core. The mechanical arms assisted him in handling the heavier pieces, ensuring every connection was secure and precise. As the assembly progressed, Tony meticulously wired the circuits, double-checking each connection to ensure optimal conductivity and energy efficiency. The workshop filled with the hum of machinery and the occasional beep from diagnostic devices as Tony worked with unwavering concentration. Friday, status update, Tony requested, wiping sweat from his brow with the back of his hand. All primary components integrated and circuits connected, Friday reported. Awaiting final calibration and power-up sequence, Tony took a deep breath, his heart racing with anticipation. With meticulous care, he performed the final calibration, adjusting settings and parameters according to the real-time feedback from Friday's diagnostic readings. Prepare for initial power-up, Tony announced, his voice tinged with excitement and determination. With a flick of a switch, the workshop was bathed in a soft, pulsating glow as the arc reactor came to life. Tony's eyes widened in awe as he watched the energy levels stabilize on the diagnostic screens, confirming the successful activation of the reactor. We did it, Friday! Tony exclaimed, unable to contain his joy and pride. The arc reactor is operational. The mechanical arms, programmed to celebrate success, performed a cheerful dance around Tony, who joined in with infectious enthusiasm. In that moment, surrounded by his creations and guided by his AI assistant, Tony Stark proved that age was no barrier to ambition, innovation, and achieving the extraordinary in his workshop. Tony put both hands on his workbench as silently sobbed, Are you seeing this old friend? 
I did it. I built it. Just like how I promised you I would. I built a miniature arc reactor. Tony felt a hand on his shoulders. When he looked back, there was no one there. Tony all smiled as the tears ran down his eyes. Thanks for the support, buddy. Enjoy the afterlife. Third person's POV. When Tony exited his lab, he walked toward his mother and father, who were each sipping wine together. Upon seeing Tony, Maria looked at him with concern. Is something wrong, honey? Tony didn't answer and just grabbed her hand, pulling her off her seat. She turned toward Howard worriedly. Howard shrugged his shoulders and shook his head, until Tony, with his mother in tow, grabbed his father's hand as well. Now, with both of them in hand, he started leading them somewhere. Tony? What is it, son? What do you want to show us? Tony didn't reply as he kept dragging them until they reached his lab. He then stopped and stood behind them. Enter was all Tony said. Maria and Howard looked at each other before they both entered, and what they saw left them in awe. It was a circular object with a pulsating blue light standing on a workbench surrounded by tools. Even from where they stood, they felt the energy the object was emanating. Tony, is that what I think it is? Howard asked in awe. They turned and looked at Tony, who was smiling smugly. You tell me, father. Howard went towards Tony, picked him up into the air, and started to throw him around. You actually did it, you crazy son of a gun. You actually built a miniature arc reactor. I couldn't be any prouder, Howard said as he brought Tony into a hug. Howard then brought them into one big family hug. Maria gave Tony a kiss on the cheek as she congratulated him. Howard looked at everything. Truly, Tony, this is amazing. And you're only seven years old going into eight. Come, let's go and celebrate, Howard said. Can we do that tomorrow? I still want to do research on it. And Melissa is going to be here any minute, Tony said, smiling towards the arc reactor. Howard smiled as he patted Tony's head. Sure, son, whatever you need. Every step Howard took was one with pride. Maria, who was walking behind him, shook her head. Tony looked at the reactor and smiled. Things are about to change. Tony took his seat and went back to the screen with the stylus. Friday, pull up the manipulatable hologram of the files marked Project the Iron Man. Mark 1 a holographic image of the classic Iron Man suit appeared, except it was painted a different color. Instead of the usual red and gold, Tony added his own colors, something to make his own individuality. Even though he was known as Tony Stark, he was his own person. It was black with neon blue lighting, which, in his opinion, looked much better. Friday, use the simulation you ran of the arc reactor and implement it into the Iron Man tech. In the hologram, an image of a small arc reactor was placed in the empty chest piece, and Tony saw how it started glowing and powering up. He then heard a knock on the door to his lab. Who is it? Friday? It is Melissa Shield, Master. Tony nodded. Let her in. He spun around in his seat as the door to his lab opened. Just who I wanted to see. Melissa was wearing a lab coat with glasses on her face and her hair tied in a ponytail. Are you serious? Melissa blushed. What? The glasses and the lab coat? Really? I actually usually wear glasses since I need them. The lab coat is just me being fashionable. Whatever, Tony said, rolling his eyes, which caused her to pout. She then saw the pulsating arc reactor and looked at it curiously. What is that? The heart of what's going to make me a superhero. Melissa looked at him, confused which caused Tony to sigh. Come grab a seat. She did as she was told and sat next to Tony. She saw the Iron Man hologram and looked at it in awe. Whoa, what is that? The thing you're going to help me build. I call it the Iron Man. What does it do? She asked, her curiosity growing the more she looked at it. See the thing in its chest, right? Tony asked. Melissa nodded. Well, that's the thing on the table over there. It works as a battery that powers the suit. Friday, show a small simulation of what the suit can do, Tony commanded. The hologram then displayed thrusters emerging from the suit, flying around, and lifting a car with just one hand. Melissa was shaking in her seat. What are you doing? That is amazing! She exclaimed with childlike wonder. 
She grabbed Tony's shoulders and began to shake him. Are you really going to let me help you build it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's begin, she said, clenching her fist. Tony was pretty sure he saw fire burning in her eyes. Melissa wore a mask and goggles that made her eyes look extra wide as she twisted a bolt around a piece of equipment. She then heard Tony's voice over an intercom. Melissa, you done? Yes, she shouted, taking everything off her face and carrying two pieces of silver armor towards Tony, who was in another room connected to his lab. Wow, these are heavy, Melissa grunted. She found Tony with two pieces of armor around his arms, connected to an arc reactor on his chest, waiting for her. Why is this room mostly empty? Melissa asked curiously. I had my dad make it as a small testing site. Melissa nodded as she put the pieces down near Tony's leg. Here, let me help you put them on. Melissa helped Tony put on the leg armor, securely connecting it to the arc reactor that was framed on his chest. After securing both pieces, she gave them a little tap. You are now good to go. Tony nodded his head. Stand back, please. Melissa nodded and stood all the way back. All right, Friday. Start at 0.1 thrust capacity and slowly increase the numbers until I'm up in the air. Thrusters started escaping from his palms and feet. Ever so slowly, Tony was lifted off the ground. Wow, whoa, whoa, Tony said, trying to maintain his balance. Haha, you see this, Melissa? I'm doing it. I'm actually doing it. Tony happily laughed as he wobbly moved his hands to stabilize himself. Melissa was clapping and cheering. You're actually doing it. Ha 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 ha. This is amazing, Tony. Tony was slowly moving back and forth. He then started to lower himself. Here, you have to try this out. Wait, really? Melissa asked worriedly. I mean, of course. You helped me build it. It's only fair you have a go at it. Come help me take these off so we can put them on you. After a while of taking it off him, it was Melissa's turn to wear the small gears. Friday starts slowly as well. 0.1 as well. As Melissa started to rise, she became nervous. Tony, Tony, I'm scared. Relax, Tony said calmly and reassuringly. Take a deep breath. Melissa nodded, took a deep breath, and allowed herself to relax slowly. She started to fly and hover over the ground, laughing happily. Ha ha ha, Tony, Tony, are you watching? I'm doing it. After a while, ever so slowly, she came down. After Tony undid her gear, she jumped into Tony, giving him a giant hug. Did you see me? I was amazing. The thing went shum and pijamamamam and then and then. As she started breathing heavily, Tony motioned for her to calm down. You're too excited. You're even becoming tired from how excited you are. You're right, you're right, sorry. But it was the coolest thing ever. Damn straight. Now let's go ahead and start making the rest before it gets too late. Melissa nodded, still clearly very excited. Third person's POV. Tony, Howard started, looking at his son with a discerning expression. You are now eight years old, and honestly, I don't know what to give you that you yourself can't already make. I know you're working on a project with Melissa, something you keep private and want for yourself. So, I decided to give you something entirely new, something even I myself haven't been able to acquire. Tony, who was in his father's home office, looked at him quizzically. I have many things to say. First, why are you saying it like you're giving me your will? And two, you can't really gift something you don't have to someone else. Howard chuckled. Because what I'm about to give you was supposed to be in my will if I ever did pass. Honestly, you're just too incredible. As you are already aware, I possess the quirk called computerized brain, which means my brain works like a computer. Now, the downside to the quirk is that it's really hard to use creativity. My brain works best with facts and knowledge. So, you possess something I don't have, something I'm quite jealous of. You have creativity and the freedom to think outside the box. Howard then stood up and walked towards a section of the bookcase in his office. He reached over and pulled a door, causing the shelf to split apart, revealing another door. Howard scanned his hand. After a green flash and an audible click, the door opened. Tony was taken aback when Howard opened the door. It led to a small room with one table in the middle, 
upon which sat a small replica of Stark Industries. Howard picked it up and brought it to Tony. Here, I want you to have it. I know I'm eight, but I never really had a thing for playing with toys. Thanks for the gift, though. It's the thought that counts, as they say. Howard scoffed, finding Tony's retort amusing. No, Tony, it's not a toy. This is something I only managed to make halfway through. I can't complete the other half. I used all of my quirks power when making this. I almost gave myself an aneurysm and had to be in urgent care for an entire week. You're serious? I'm afraid so. That's what happens when I try to push that creativity and go beyond my quirks limits. So, when I tell you I can't finish it, I literally mean it could lead to my death. Damn old man. So, what is this thing anyway? Tony asked, though he already had an idea. The creation of an entirely new element. Tony smirked upon hearing the confirmation. Nice. Having the younger generation take over. Eh, old man? Stop calling me old man. I'm still in my late thirties, which means I'm still in my prime. Anyway, yes, I want you to have it. It's yours. Sorry, I can't, Tony said, shrugging his shoulders. Howard was surprised. What? Why? I just meant that it can't possibly be mine. I mean, you already completed half of it. All I'm doing is finishing the other half. It wouldn't be fair for me to take credit. So, the best I can do is make this a project between father and son. Howard had a soft smile on his face as he already guessed what Tony was trying to do. He nodded his head. All right, fine. You win. It's a project between father and son. Tony nodded. A skip in his step as he walked towards his lab. I'm off to discover a new element. Father. Call you in an hour. Howard scoffed. I'm afraid it's not that easy, Tony. It'll take more than just an hour, even for you, and he's already gone. Great. Tony set the model of the Stark Expo on the workbench. As he did so, he glanced to the side and saw Melissa working intently on an Iron Man armor, sparks flying from the metal face covering she wore. She was so absorbed in her work that she didn't notice Tony enter the lab, causing him to shake his head in amusement. Friday, scan the model and conjure a 3D manipulatable hologram of the Expo. One of the mechanical limbs around the workbench extended, a green light scanning the Expo model. A holographic image of the Expo then materialized above the real model. Hologram completed as requested, Master, Friday said. Tony manipulated the hologram with his fingers, spinning it around like a basketball before setting it upright in front of him. He clicked on the globe in the hologram and enlarged it slightly. Friday, we're seeing the same thing, right? It appears to represent the appearance of an atom, Master, Friday confirmed. That's right, Tony said, clicking the middle of the globe, which means the nucleus should be about right here. He expanded a section of the globe. Now lose the footpath, the landscaping, the bushes and trees, Tony instructed, swiping away everything extraneous from the screen, including the parking lots, exits and entrances. Now structure the neutrons and protons using the pavilions, Tony continued, spinning in his chair. The hologram shifted, rearranging the pavilions into clusters representing neutrons and protons around the nucleus. Tony watched the transformation keenly. Good, he said. Now let's add an additional orbital layer. Calculate optimal electron positions for maximum stability. Friday complied, showing new electron pathways forming around the nucleus and calculating their positions. Simulate interactions with various elements and compounds, Tony commanded. After a few moments, Friday responded, simulation indicates high stability and unique bonding properties. Master, Tony's eyes lit up. Interesting. Enhance the model with potential energy states and reactivity profiles. Friday enhanced the hologram, displaying energy levels and reactivity with different elements. This new element has potential beyond our initial expectations, Tony mused. Document all findings and prepare for prototype synthesis and real-world testing. Documentation in progress, Master, Friday confirmed. Friday, call my father. For some reason, I feel like breaking his heart a little. Tony teased himself. A holographic projection appeared, indicating the call to Howard. After a few rings, Howard's face appeared on the hologram. What is it, Tony? 
It hasn't even been 30 minutes. Already giving up, Tony? Howard asked slowly. Tony beamed, his smile so large his eyes were closed. Yes, father. What's that behind you? And why did you call me? Tony waved it off. Oh, that is just a new element I discovered a while ago. I just called since I was bored and had nothing better to do. Don't mind me in the slightest. Howard's expression was the most deadpan Tony had ever seen. I'm hanging up and disowning you. Ha! Huh. Tony was genuinely taken aback by the last part. Meanwhile, woohoo! He did it. He really did it. That's my boy. Ha 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 ha. 30 minutes hadn't even passed. Howard celebrated with the largest smile on his face. Third person's POV. Melissa finished up the last touches. There, I'm done. When she lifted her metal mask, she saw Tony looking at an empty hologram with a bit of surprise, displaying an element she hadn't seen before. Hey, Tony, I'm done, Melissa called out, snapping him out of his trance. Huh? All right, so we can begin. Mark 1 is completed. Tony smirked as Melissa nodded, looking at the Iron Man armor in front of her. It took us three months because we messed around with some parts and accidentally destroyed a few more. But we can begin test flights whenever you're ready, Melissa said. They then heard Friday's voice warning them. Master, your father appears to be on the way here based on his path. Oh, they both said as they started rushing around the room. They quickly put a tarp over the armor just before they heard a knock on the door. The tarp concealed what was hidden underneath, appearing as just a flat sheet over something. Come in, Tony yelled, and soon his father walked through the door. Melissa, your father's waiting for you. He's leaving already, Howard said. Melissa looked at her watch. Oh man, it's late. She turned towards Tony and pointed a finger at him. You better not try it without me, Tony. I swear. Yes, yes, princess, I promise, Tony said, waving her off. Melissa rolled her eyes at the nickname before waving goodbye to both Tony and Howard. She then peeked her head back in. Oh, and Tony... Once again, happy birthday, she said before leaving. Yeah, yeah, I already said thanks, he yelled after her. So you really did it, huh? Howard said, looking at the floating element. Tony nodded. I need your help to bring it forth, though. Oh, Howard said, looking down at Tony curiously. We need to make a particle accelerator. Do you even have the materials needed to make it here? Howard asked. I don't. That's why I said I need your help. Howard looked at his son with a deadpan expression. So the issue is money, huh? Yeah, I spent my allowance on the thing I'm presenting to you tomorrow, Tony said, motioning towards the tarp. You really are secretive about that thing. Of course, you'll be so jealous. Anyway, would you be able to get the materials? It's pretty late. Tony, we're rich. Oh, right. Ho, 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 ho. They both then faked laugh like rich people before actually laughing. Howard shook his head. Make a note of everything you'll need. Tony nodded. Stainless steel or aluminum for vacuum chamber walls, electron guns or ion sources for particle generation, copper or superconducting wire for electromagnets, copper for RF cavities, photo detectors and data acquisition systems for beam diagnostics, transformers and capacitors for power supplies, heat exchangers and cooling fluids for cooling systems, computers with interface cards for control systems, emergency shutdown systems, and radiation shielding for safety systems, and reinforced. Concrete or steel for infrastructure. Did you get that? Tony asked after his rant. Howard nodded and said, Wait, I need to make a phone call. After five minutes, he returned. It'll be here in 30 minutes. Tony nodded, and the two then waited. An hour later, it took another 30 minutes to bring everything inside and set it down in Tony's testing room. Tony surveyed the array of components. Well, old man, looks like we'll be pretty busy. I don't want you hurting your back when we start making it, Tony remarked, half-jokingly. Howard shook his head. Why are you like this? Tony just shrugged his shoulders, a smirk playing on his lips as they began unpacking and organizing the materials. The vacuum chamber was carefully positioned in one corner, while the electromagnets and RF cavities were laid out on sturdy workbenches. Power supplies and control systems were placed strategically nearby, ready to be wired up. All right, 
Let's get to work, Howard said, rolling up his sleeves. Over the next few hours, they worked side by side. They connected wires, adjusted settings, and tested each component meticulously. Tony's expertise with electronics and Howard's mechanical finesse complemented each other perfectly. With a final adjustment and a few last-minute checks, they stood back to admire their creation. A sophisticated particle accelerator, assembled from scratch in Tony's humble testing room. Ready? Tony asked, hand hovering over the control panel. He finished putting a crystal prism inside it. Howard nodded, his heart swelling with pride. Let's see what it can do. Tony grinned, pressing the power button. The room hummed to life with a gentle buzz as systems powered on. They watched as indicators lit up and monitors displayed vital signs. It's working, Howard murmured, awestruck. Initializing particle accelerator, they heard Friday's voice say. A blue light started flashing around the accelerator. The light grew brighter in power and as it glowed, Howard went and grabbed a giant wrench which he put by the valve. Howard smiled as he said, Tony helped me out. Tony went as they both began to move it, which moved the crystal prism. As the prism moved, blue light exited from the accelerator and started burning and cutting everything it touched. They slowly moved it until it reached a metal triangle that was hoisting it up in front of them. As the blue light and triangle made contact, it started to glow brighter and make a small humming. Tony quickly turned it off, Howard said, but Tony was all right on it and turned it off. All that remained was a bright blue triangle humming with power. They both walked towards it examining it. Tony grabbed tweezers and picked up. Examining it closer, they both stared in awe. Congratulations, Master and Sir. You two have created a brand new element, Friday informed them. The arc reactor. Quick, get it, Tony said towards Howard. He nodded as he went and got it. They took out the palladium core and Tony carefully put in the bright triangle in the middle. The reactor closed around the new elemental core and started to slowly hum with power. After it had settled Friday then said, Master, the reactor has accepted the modified core. I will now begin running diagnostics. Yeah. You go do that, Tony said absent-mindedly. Tony and Howard just looked at each other, unsure of what to say. Slowly a smile started growing on their faces. They both leaned and examined the arc reactor, unable to look away from it. So Friday, what's the verdict? Tony said, spinning around in his chair. Master, the modified core is stable. Friday's voice echoed through the room, breaking the brief silence that followed their successful integration of the new elemental core into the arc reactor. The new element exhibits optimal stability and energy efficiency. Friday continued. Initial diagnostics show power output exceeding previous simulations. Integration with existing systems is seamless. Tony nodded, a satisfied grin spreading across his face. Excellent, Friday. What about potential applications beyond the reactor? Analysis suggests broad applications in energy generation, propulsion, and advanced materials, Friday reported. Further exploration into these areas is recommended to maximize potential benefits. Howard looked impressed, nodding approvingly. And safety protocols? Core containment and safety protocols are functioning within established parameters, Friday assured them. There are no indications of instability or risks at this time. Tony exchanged a glance with Howard, both sharing a moment of quiet pride. Thank you, Friday. Begin preparations for the next phase of testing and development. Understood, Master, Friday acknowledged. I will initiate protocols for continued monitoring and optimization. As they both let out a sigh of relief, they both yawned, making them realize that they were beyond tired. Well, I better get enough sleep. I'm showing you something amazing later on. Old man, can you get a large airspace for us and rent it out to make sure no one is available to witness what I'm going to show you? Howard looked at Tony curiously but shrugged his shoulders. Sure, think of it as a reward for what we just accomplished and like that they called it a day. Third person's POV. Howard, Maria, and David were seen standing outside a hangar with a runway in front of them. Did Tony tell you what he wanted to show you? Melissa didn't want to say anything about it. All she kept saying was that it was amazing. David asked, looking towards Howard and Maria. They both shook their heads. They've been pretty secretive about this project, Howard said. They then heard something like a will moving behind them. When they looked, 
They saw Melissa pushing one of those machines that shoot out tennis balls. Howard blinked a few times and looked towards Melissa, who was wearing a lab coat, an earpiece, and a backpack. I'm sorry to say, dear, but those already exist, Howard teased. Melissa let out a sigh and shook her head. You're just like Tony. Howard only smiled upon hearing that. Melissa reached for her backpack and pulled out a tablet. She then tapped the earpiece and said, You can start now, Tony. They barely managed to hear Tony's voice as he said, Copy that. Start what, sweetie? David asked. Melissa didn't answer and just pointed to the air. Soon, they saw a red and gold metal suit of armor flying around. They saw how the armor had its legs tucked together while its arms were a bit apart and was flying in the air. It started moving around, doing flips and spinning. It even started riding in the air with the trail of smoke it left. The name Tony Stark was written before it was underlined. At first, Tony wanted to make the suit black and blue for individuality, but since it was the first Iron Man ever made, he decided on making it his signature color. Soon, the piece of armor dropped from the sky and landed in front of them on one knee, cracking the ground due to its weight. Superhero landing, they heard Tony whisper. As he looked up, the mask also went up, revealing his face. He watched in amusement as they stood with their mouths agape and their eyes widened. Melissa went in front of them and snapped their picture on the tablet, giving Tony a thumbs up. I got it. The flash from the picture snapped them out of their trance. Tony, what are you wearing? What is that? Howard asked excitedly, his excitement only growing as he looked at the arc reactor on Tony's chest. I look cool, right? Tony said smugly. And this is my superhero outfit. Maria softly smiled at Tony. I see, so this was the answer to the question that day. Okay. Wow, you figured that out way too quickly, Tony said, looking at his mother oddly. I'm your mother. It's only natural, she said smugly. David looked at the suit in awe. What else can it do? I'm glad you asked, Davy, Tony teased, causing David to scoff slightly. Melissa hit it, Tony said. Melissa nodded and gave a few taps on the tablet. The tennis machine started charging up, and a ball was then shot into the air. They watched as Tony aimed a hand towards the ball. They heard the sound of something quickly charging up before being released. Where Zap they watched a repulsor shot shoot out from Tony's armored hand and hit the ball, causing it to explode upon impact. More, Melissa. Melissa gave the screen a few more taps and more balls shot out. Tony moved his hands back and forth, shooting repulsors from both his hands, each hitting the balls and causing them to explode. Tony then turned towards them and gave them a thumbs up with a large smile. Whoa, Howard and David muttered. You guys haven't seen anything yet. Melissa, rapid fire, Tony said as he crossed his arms. Melissa's fingers started to rapidly tap on the tablet, and the balls all shot out in a rapid burst. They heard the sound of something charging up once again, but this time it was much louder. Tony puffed out his chest, and a large repulsor beam shot out from it. Tony followed the rows of tennis balls as they disintegrated upon contact. They were all left speechless. Tony and Melissa performed a low five before bumping fists. Tony, are you planning on taking over the world? Howard asked, unsure of what else he was supposed to think after such a demonstration. I'm only showing you this so we can get more funds to continue building and creating new things, Tony said with a smile, completely ignoring the question. Howard put a hand on his chin and narrowed his eyes pensively. Tony, tell me, what are your future plans? Why? Like always, humor me. Tony shrugged his shoulders. I was planning on studying abroad in Japan for hero school. I looked it up and UA is the best school there. Since I declared I wanted to be a hero, I'm following through. I'm going where the Hero Association was first created and where the three-time world champion currently resides. Howard then turned towards Melissa. And how about you? Tony already told me his plan before, so I did my own research. Turns out UA has its own tech department, so I was planning on joining that. Plus, I can see Uncle Might if I go there, so it's a win-win. Howard nodded. Tony, when you turn 10, I'm putting you in charge of a Stark branch in Japan, and Melissa, you will be going there as his secretary. What? They all shouted as they looked at Howard. 
Tony's suit was now unimportant compared to the news Howard just dropped. Tony was the only one who didn't react. He just nodded his head and accepted the news. You're not sending my baby all on his own to another country, Maria said with narrowed eyes. He won't be alone. I have a friend there who owes me a couple of favors. I'm sure he would be more than glad to have Tony and Melissa. You remember the Yale Yorisis, honey. You even got along very well with the missus. Why is my daughter included in your plans, Howard? David asked with narrowed eyes. Howard didn't answer with words. He just made a motion with his hands that said, Take a look for yourself. Melissa was standing next to Tony, holding the tablet close to her chest, and her earpiece had a blue glow. The glasses didn't help the case. Melissa looked like the definition of a secretary standing next to Tony. Have you even asked your son if he wanted this? I sure as well know my daughter didn't agree to this, David said, not having anything else to retort. No, and I don't need to. Tony's smart. He already figured out why I'm doing this. They all then turned to look at him. Oh, you want me to explain it? Tony said before sighing. Basically, he wants me to not be dependent on him for money and make my own. This will also be a test to see if I can take care of a business so when the time comes, he can safely pass Stark Industries down to me. Probably when I graduate or something, Tony briefly explained. Hey, you even figured out this was a test, Howard said with pride. David ignored him. I'm not letting my only daughter be away from me. Please let me go. Daddy, Melissa said, looking at David pleadingly. What? But why? No offense, but you've only known Tony for like three or so months. I don't think the reason you would want to follow him to another country is because you guys are the best of friends. Two reasons, Melissa said, raising two fingers. First, I told Tony I was going to be his lab assistant. I don't want to go back on my word. And second, just like you said, I've only known him for three months, but in those three months I've learned so much, things I wouldn't even have thought possible. I want to keep on learning new things from Tony. If I have to follow him to another country to learn, then so be it. But honey, that would mean being away from each other, David said sadly. Melissa hesitated. I promise to visit during the holidays? Hearing that, David almost went to his knees as he held his heart in pain. My own daughter. Maria just patted his shoulder with a sympathetic look. Can we go back to testing my armor, please? Tony pleaded. Oh, right, Melissa said upon realizing why they were there. Have you tried going at your max speed? Tony shook his head as he walked towards the runway. During this time, David turned towards Howard. We'll talk more about this later. And properly, Howard had a serious expression as he nodded. Tony then got on the runway, tucked his legs together, and stuck out his arms slightly. He shot into the sky, creating a giant gust of wind that stirred up a cloud of dust. They all had to cover their faces and take a step back. Once the dust cleared, Melissa was looking at the tablet with concentration. So, how fast is he going? Howard asked as he saw how high Tony was flying. Melissa turned the tablet towards everyone. He's currently going at Mach 5. I think the new arc reactor would allow him to go faster, but his thrusters were not designed to accept any more power than the previous arc reactor had, Melissa explained. Incredible, Maria couldn't help but say. Do you know what he called that suit? David asked curiously. Melissa nodded. He called it Mark I, third person's POV. Tony was flying over the ocean in his Mark I Iron Man armor. W-O-O-H. He shouted, feeling freer than ever. He glanced at his reflection in the water, but his speed parted the waves. Lucian spun around, put his hands in front of him, and shot up towards the sky. This is amazing, he exclaimed, losing count of how many times he had told himself that. He quickly passed through a cloud, and the condensation slid off him. Friday, what's the highest record someone has flown up on their own without a space shuttle? The highest a person has traveled using only their quirk is 50,000 meters, or 50 kilometers. And what's our current altitude? 1,700 meters, 3,400 meters and climbing by the second, Friday responded as the overlay screen displayed the data. We've entered the area where frost can accumulate. How's that looking? All systems are operational, master. 
The heater is currently working as intended. Good, Tony said, keeping his eyes on his altitude. As he flew up, various ideas filled his mind, different suits, different weapons. Can I create vibranium? It should be possible. All I need to do is calculate its atomic structure and elemental components. Friday, create a file called vibranium. It is done, master. In just 20 seconds, Tony reached around 34,000 meters. In five more seconds, he reached 42,500 meters. I wonder what else from Marvel I can bring forth to reality, he thought. Friday, create multiple files. Adamantium, unstable molecule fibers, PIM particles. For now, Tony stopped as he neared his target altitude. In total, 29 seconds had passed, and Tony had reached 49,300 meters. In just 30 seconds, he hit 51,000 meters, completely breaking the previous record. Tony hovered with one leg, arms spread out, staring into the sun. You know, when I painted Iron Man red and gold, I kind of expected to have an identity crisis. I was worrying about nothing. Just flying here, away from everything, made me realize something. I am not Tony Stark from the Marvel Universe, and in turn, he absolutely isn't me. I'm not some impersonator or thief. I am just me. I am just Anthony Stark, and nothing or no one will be able to take that away from me. What was that, Master? Friday asked. Nothing, Friday. Nothing. Let's free fall, he said, putting his hands behind his head and beginning to fall back down. Oh, and create another file named Solar Battery and a different file named Mark II. After Tony returned, he let Melissa have a go, although David was worried sick. Melissa seemed to have enjoyed it, though. She couldn't stop shaking afterward due to her excitement, appearing as if she was going through a sugar rush. After demonstrating the Iron Man suit, Tony and Melissa were back in his lab, looking at the hologram projection of the armor they had just made. We need to upgrade many things on it, Melissa said with a serious expression. Tony nodded. We need better thrusters. The ones we have suffice, but better is always better, as they say. Melissa looked at Tony oddly before shaking her head. We also need to work on how to carry it around. We had a bit of difficulty transporting it from place to place, she said. And not to mention putting it on is a hassle. We need to work on that as well, Tony said. We can use the collapse tech you mentioned previously, Melissa suggested. Good idea, but we still need to worry about the weight. It isn't exactly what I would consider a handbag. Not to mention the braking. In some instances, when I wanted to stop, I had to do it early because the momentum would still carry me, Melissa added. Let's first start with Mark II and the Collapse Tech. As we go deeper, we'll worry about the other things. Who knows, we might come up with the solution as we go, Tony said. It took them two months to complete Mark II, due to the many intricate problems implementing the Collapse Tech created. During those two months, Tony also tried to work on his other files but underestimated how challenging they would be, even with an AI at his disposal. When they completed the Mark II armor, Tony and Melissa decided to relax for a bit. Their family took them to a private beach where they just relaxed and forgot all about their problems. That vacation lasted two weeks. Once they returned, they immediately got back to work with refreshed minds. This time it took them only one month to complete Mark III. They used a lighter metal, making it easier to carry around. But that also compromised its durability. During this time, Tony asked for a fighting instructor, which Howard thought was a good idea. Naturally, Melissa joined in as well. The instructor was a B-rank hero, a 30-year-old man with black hair, a thick beard, and a military background. While his name was George, his hero name was Shatter. His quirk, weak point, allowed him to see the weak points of things. The downside of my quirk is that I need to be strong enough to take advantage of those weak points. The upside is that I used my quirk to see my own weak points and guard against them. So while you're training under me, I will keep attacking those weak points of yours until you can guard against them. Do I make myself clear? Sir. Yes, sir. Tony and Melissa saluted. After training under him for a week, Tony thought George was a great teacher, or at least his quirk made him so. He taught Tony and Melissa the proper stance for kicking and punching. After their practice, they were back in their lab. What if we added weapons to make up for the lost durability? 
Melissa suggested. It'll just add back the weight. But eh, I got nothing else, so let's go with it, Tony shrugged. Since they couldn't get their hands on ammunition, they designed weapons that shot lasers using energy from the arc reactor. Tony and Melissa each had a glow from the Iron Man armor. On top of it, a small gun was present. They shot holographic targets that floated around, practicing their marksmanship. Mark IV was soon completed, mostly composed of laser weaponry. Out of all his files, Tony only completed two, the solar battery and the unstable molecule fiber. Melissa was in her section of the lab, while Tony was leaning back in his. Thanks to the Mark IV Iron Man armor, Melissa had developed a fascination with weapons. Melissa stopped and turned towards Tony, who was deep in thought. So the expo is in a few months. Have you thought about what you're going to present? That's right, the expo. I forgot about that, Tony sighed. No, not really, but I bet I can quickly come up with something, right? I forgot that there's no I Island in this world. The Stark Expo has become that very thing. Are you going to show off one of the marks? Are you crazy? For an expo? Of course not. Melissa was paying attention as Tony was talking and ended up puncturing a tiny part of her thumb. Ouchie, she said, flicking her hand and sucking her thumb. Seeing the scene, Tony narrowed his eyes before smirking. Friday, create a file. Master, I would highly recommend completing one of your ongoing projects before starting another. Just create the file, Tony sighed. And what would the master want to name said file? Project Baymax. Third person's POV. A month after Tony turned nine, the Stark Expo began. It was a grand event where everyone showcased their inventions. Besides inventions, the expo also featured studies about quirks. The Stark Expo was an artificial moving island, home to thousands of scientists from all over the world. Tony and Melissa arrived on the island by private plane, each carrying a suitcase. As soon as they disembarked, they were bombarded with camera flashes from all directions. Well, we certainly are popular, Tony said glancing at his father, who was a few steps behind with his mother, David, and some security guards. We hold the most power when it comes to technological advancement. What do you think? Howard replied. Tony reached for the glasses hanging from his shirt and put them on. I think I love being rich. Melissa tapped the side of her glasses, darkening the tint to protect her from the flashes. Should I really be seen with you guys? She asked, a bit nervous. Melissa, honey, you've been with us for two years. You're practically family, Tony said, waving off her concern. Plus, you're doing it wrong. Doing what wrong? When in front of reporters, you're not supposed to appear nervous. You look straightforward, chin high, and walk like they matter nothing, Tony said, demonstrating. See? Just follow my lead. Melissa adopted a serious expression as she mimicked Tony's confident walk. David's eyebrow twitched as he sighed at the scene. They soon arrived at their private building, built just for them. Howard turned to Tony and Melissa. Tomorrow is the official beginning of the expo. Why don't you get settled down and explore this place a bit? Sure, why not? Tony shrugged. After settling down, Howard gave them passes to hang around their necks and told them to enjoy themselves. As they went outside, Tony and Melissa touched the sides of their shoes activating a metal exterior that extended beneath them to form hoverboards. They rose into the air, gliding smoothly. You can never go wrong with a hoverboard, Tony said. A lollipop stick jutting from his mouth. They flew around, weaving through the crowds, with kids their age looking on in amazement. They soon arrived at a large white building. Friday, their AI provided them with information about it. So this is a museum that shows super advanced support equipment for heroes, Tony summarized. Let's explore it, Melissa said excitedly. They showed their passes, which allowed them early access to the exhibits. Most displays were robots designed for specific tasks. First aid, rescue, firefighting. Our suits are better, Melissa said. Tony scoffed. Is it even a fair comparison? They saw powerful excavation tools, jetpacks, large rocket boots, and barriers made to protect against bullets. Have we made a suit made with simply barriers? Melissa asked. Tony shook his head. Tony then smirked. 
It looks to me like you enjoy making suits more than I do. Melissa blushed slightly. It's just really fun creating new suits. I wasn't saying anything bad about it, Tony teased. As they continued exploring, they gathered many ideas for new marks. What about two different kinds of suits? One for rescue missions and one for apprehending villains. They could be Mark 9 and 10, Melissa suggested, seeing glowing blue ribbons restraining a robot. Just note everything down, Tony said as they finished exploring the museum. Afterward, they decided to get something to eat. Tony opted for a simple burger with french fries and a milkshake. Melissa chose pizza with a large soda. Once done, they continued exploring the island and came across a cork training ground. Teens in hero suits were competing in various activities like obstacle courses, target practice, and rescue competitions. Melissa and Tony watched, using the opportunity to brainstorm suits based on people's quirks. Oh, how about one with the power to control the electromagnetic spectrum? Melissa suggested. That one should be tough but not impossible. It also reminded me that we need to make some that aren't affected by those with magnetic quirks, Tony said. After growing bored, they decided to call it a day and head back home. So what are you going to present at the expo? Tony asked. Melissa scoffed. You're not telling me what this Baymax project of yours is. So I'm not telling you mine. Whoa, so childish. What? Melissa glared at Tony, who was teasing her. Well, may the best man win, Tony said with a thumbs up. I'm a girl, and it's about time someone put you in your place. You might have created something amazing like always, but I created multiple things to defeat you, Melissa said. I'm sure at least one of those things will be enough to defeat you. Quality over quantity, my dear friend, Melissa scoffed. I'm going to make some last minute touches, she said, heading towards her room. Sounds like someone isn't very confident in their win if they need to make last minute touches, Tony teased. Melissa covered her ears. La 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 la. I can't hear you. Tony just smiled and shook his head as he also went to make some last-minute checks for the expo tomorrow. After he was done, he put the red and purple metal box to the side. He lay in bed and tapped the side of his glasses. They expanded and slowly turned into visors that covered most of his eyes. He was able to see multiple holograms in front of him that he could manipulate but were visible only to him. Let's see what adjustments we can make, Tony said focusing on the screen. He typed rapidly, pulling up the latest simulation data and visual models of the vibranium structure. All right, Friday, bring up the atomic configuration and the energy absorption patterns. The holographic display shifted, showing a detailed atomic lattice with energy pathways highlighted in different colors. Tony scrutinized the data. If we modify the lattice spacing and introduce some stabilizing agents. Friday, Run a simulation with these parameters. Adjust the atomic spacing by 0.02 nanometers and introduce a carbon-based bonding agent. Running the simulation now, Master Friday replied. The progress bar filled rapidly and the new results popped up on the screen. The structural integrity has improved by 12%, but it still fails under maximum stress conditions, Friday reported. Tony went on to try many other patterns and sequences only managing to bring it up by an additional 3%. Keep running simulations on your own. If you come across any obstacles, be sure to inform me, Tony instructed. Understood, Master. And good night, Friday replied. Good night to you too, Friday, Tony said as he took off the glasses and went to sleep. Third person's POV. The next day, everything appeared like a big celebration. The place was filled with decorations. Everyone had big smiles on their faces as they entered a giant building with a sign that was bright red and red. The Stark Expo. As Tony and Melissa made their way towards the expo, Melissa turned to Tony. I know this is mostly an exposition, hence the name. But I heard there will still be judges and the one with the highest score wins. But what do they win? One of the most important things a scientist can get. Exposure and recognition, Tony answered before fully explaining. They will gain opportunities. Big and famous heroes will come to them when they need something, which in turn would make them somewhat famous. Winning the expo opens a lot of doors for people so it's a really big deal. 
For example, if someone wants a job and they've won an expo before, they would be automatically hired. Melissa nodded in understanding before narrowing her eyes at him slightly. What? Tony asked. Your dad owns everything, which means you will too. You will be their boss. What if the judges choose your creation as the winner to curry favor? Don't worry about that. The judges are impartial. That's been the case for many years, Tony reassured her. I'll trust you on this, Melissa said. When they got inside the building, they saw multiple panels with different advertisements trying to draw people in. They maneuvered through the crowd while carrying their suitcases. Soon, they saw two empty panels. One had Tony's name on it, and the one across from it had Melissa's name. Try not to cry when everyone turns their backs on you to look at my expo, Tony smirked. Melissa scoffed and went towards her stand, while Tony walked towards his. Each panel appeared like a stage. Tony opened his suitcase and took out two things. A red and purple box, which he laid on the ground, and a foldable chair, which he opened and sat on. Tony then took out his phone and extended it, turning it into a gaming console. Meanwhile, Melissa was taking out many items from her suitcase, most of them weapons, ranging from swords to guns, all with different colors and designs, to gauntlets of various sizes. When she turned to look at Tony, she couldn't help but twitch her lip at his behavior. She glared in his direction before shaking her head and focusing on finishing her final touches to the stage. It took nearly an hour for the expo to officially begin. Fireworks were lit up outside, visible from within. Soon, people began exploring the different panels. Seeing this, Tony smirked as he turned the gaming console back into a phone. He reached into his pockets and pulled out an earpiece to amplify his voice. He began tapping quickly on his phone, and soon every advertisement screen was hacked, showing his name, face, and location. Everyone seeing this grew interested as they had never seen anything like it. What mostly drew their attention was his last name. Tony soon saw the area around him become crowded. Why, hello everyone. I wonder what brings you all here today. Tony smirked, earning a few chuckles from the crowd. I'm not sure if you all have seen, but my name is Anthony Stark. To show off what I created here today, I would like a volunteer who isn't ashamed to divulge their medical history. Anyone interested? Tony saw a few hands go up and covered his eyes with his hands, moving them around. You! When Tony uncovered his eyes, he saw he was pointing to a woman. The beautiful woman with the beautiful smile. Oh wait, I have to be more specific since every woman here is beautiful and has a beautiful smile. This earned him a few os, mostly from the women, due to Tony's age and appearance. The woman in the white summer dress and pink hair, the woman soon made her way to the stage. So, what do you want me to do? She asked sweetly. Tony reached into his inner jacket pocket and pulled out a roll of duct tape. Please give me your arm, Tony said. Pulling on the piece of tape, the woman looked at Tony in confusion and stuck out her arm. I'm sorry, Tony said. The woman continued to look at Tony in confusion until he put the tape on her arm and ripped it off. Ouch! Why would you... Beep beep the woman stopped talking and turned towards the sound of the beeping. She saw the box on the ground next to her open up. A white marshmallow-like figure began to inflate, growing in size. Seeing the figure, many became interested and were instantly drawn to its cute appearance. The marshmallow looked down at the ground, slowly stepped out of its small box, and softly walked towards Tony and the woman. It bumped into the foldable chair, lifted it slightly off the ground, looked both ways before setting it aside, and continued waddling towards them. The marshmallow approached the woman, lifted a hand, and moved it in a circle as it introduced itself. Hello, I am Baymax, your personal healthcare companion. I was alerted to your need for medical attention when you said, ouch. The woman blinked as she stared at Baymax. A screen lit up on Baymax's stomach with numbers going from 1 to 10, with a smiley face progressively turning into a frown as the numbers increased. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you describe your pain? Um, a 3. The woman answered, unsure how to respond. Meanwhile, everyone watched curiously, interested in what was going to happen next. I will scan you now, Baymax said as it looked her up and down. Scan complete, 
It showed a white demonstration of a female body on its screen before highlighting the section around her forearm where Tony had ripped off the tape. You have a slight epidermal abrasion on your forearm, Baymax said as it lifted a finger. I suggest an antibacterial spray. Baymax waddled closer and took her hand into his. Whoa, whoa. Baymax, what if she's allergic? Tony said with a smile. The main ingredient in the antibacterial spray is bacitracin. She is not allergic to bacitracin, but she does have an allergic reaction to peaches. Whoa, I do. How did it know? The woman asked with a smile. Hearing this, the crowd began to clap slightly. Baymax then started applying the spray to the area. After he was done, he presented her with a lollipop. You have been a good girl. I hope you have a safe delivery and childbirth. The woman's face dropped. What? Tony then heard another person in the crowd scream what as well. I take it you didn't know? Tony asked. The woman shook her head, tears starting to stream down her face as she put a hand near her mouth. Can you please tell me more? During your scan, another sign of life was detected around your abdomen. Baymax said, showing a picture of the same white figure and highlighting the small sign of life it had detected. The woman turned towards Tony. It isn't lying, right? Tony shook his head. Baymax was built to detect anything within a person's body. So if it says you are pregnant, that is most definitely the case. Thank you, thank you, thank you truly. My husband and I were having a bit of difficulty conceiving. We took this trip to take our minds off it. Who knew coming here would reveal this? A man with dark blue hair came running up the stage. He picked up the woman and spun her around. We're going to have a baby, he said excitedly. Let's give the couple an applause for their wonderful news, Tony said, motioning towards them. The crowd began to clap, even more interested in Baymax. The couple gave Tony a bow of thanks and started exiting the stage. Baymax then started to follow them. Wait, Tony called out awkwardly. When they turned, they found Baymax following them, causing them to look towards Tony in confusion. It won't leave your side until the person in distress says they are satisfied with their care. The woman smiled upon hearing that and turned towards Baymax. I am satisfied with my care. Baymax nodded and started walking back towards its box. Wait, Baymax buddy, I still need you, Tony called out, making it waddle back to Tony's side. Well, that sure was a surprise, wasn't it? But a welcome one. Tony scratched the back of his head. That honestly threw me off a bit. Hold on a minute, everyone. The crowd chuckled at that. Let's talk more about Baymax, shall we? Tony went and touched the place where a normal heart would be. The area slowly opened, and out came a chip. This chip contains over 100,000 medical procedures. It is what makes Baymax, well, Baymax, your helpful healthcare companion. Due to this chip, Baymax has absolutely zero desire to harm anyone and only wants to help. His insides are mostly made of carbon fiber, making him extremely light, while his outside is made of vinyl giving him the squishy, marshmallow-like appearance, Tony said, giving Baymax a hug and sinking slightly into him. Tony then went on to present all the medical equipment he had installed in Baymax, like defibrillators in case someone went into cardiac arrest, bandages and band-aids, a heating and cooling system, and much more. Tony and Baymax then bowed to the crowd. And that everyone is Baymax, the ultimate nurse. Always making sure you are all right in this dangerous world we live in, Everyone soon began to clap, genuinely impressed with Baymax. During this expo, everyone can come up one by one to get your very own checkup by Baymax. Who knows, you might discover something you didn't know before, Tony said, winking at the couple from earlier. Everyone then became curious, wondering if they themselves had something they didn't know about. One by one, they all went and received their checkup from Baymax. Baymax discovered hidden injuries in many of them, which took most by surprise as they believed they were healed. Most of them were heroes who had fought many battles. They thanked Baymax and congratulated Tony on his incredible invention. One of the phrases Tony mostly received was, you truly are worthy of the Stark name, making him inwardly roll his eyes. Third person's POV. It was Melissa's turn to present her invention. Luckily for her, there were many people around due to Tony's intervention, so they turned towards her presentation when they finished with Tony's. 
or was it really luck? Melissa started to present her first weapon. I'm sure many of you are here to see inventions that could replicate or surpass a person's quirk. I am here today to see if I can meet your expectations. Melissa grabbed the first weapon from the display shelf. It looked like a large handgun from a sci-fi movie. It was black with light blue neon lights around the middle. Instead of words, I'll first show a demonstration of what it can do. Melissa tapped her watch and a few drones shot up from behind her, flying around. Thanks to months of practice, Melissa had become a great shot. She pulled the trigger and a light blue energy shot out, hitting a drone. Upon contact, the drone was turned into solid ice and dropped to the ground with a thud. Everyone was immediately surprised upon seeing that. Melissa shot down more drones from the skies before she began to explain her invention. The cold gun works by harnessing energy pulses to rapidly extract thermal energy from its targets. Upon activation, it projects a beam of light blue energy that instantly freezes objects upon contact. As you just witnessed with the drones, Melissa elaborated, her voice filled with enthusiasm. The technology behind it involves a specialized mechanism that absorbs heat at an incredibly fast rate, cooling the target to sub-zero temperatures within milliseconds. It's designed for precision and efficiency, capable of immobilizing targets without causing permanent harm, she added, gesturing towards the frozen drones now lying on the ground. Everyone began to clap, very impressed with her invention. After all, it replicated ice quirks. Even Tony, who was still on his platform, had an impressed look. Melissa then grabbed the handle of a sword. When she pulled it out, the blade side of the sword was missing, leaving only the back blade. I know what some of you may be thinking. What a lackluster sword, she said. Some chuckled, thinking exactly that, until Melissa pressed a button on the lever of the sword. From the sword, a blue beam of electricity filled out the missing parts. She built a lightsaber? Tony thought, raising an eyebrow with an amused look. Melissa called forth more drones, and they all came flying towards her. She grabbed the sword with both her small hands and started cutting the drones apart. There was more applause due to her performance. The sharp edge is made purely out of electricity, making it sharper than steel. It utilizes a controlled plasma field confined by magnetic containment to slice effortlessly through conventional barriers and armor. Melissa explained the intricacies of how the weapon worked. After showcasing the weapons, she went on to present hero support items. Once she was done, she gave everyone watching a bow. Thank you all for your time and patience. There was a round of applause as the audience was very impressed with Melissa, especially considering she was just a young girl able to accomplish so much. This scored a lot of points with the judges present to witness both Tony's and Melissa's exhibitions. Unfortunately for Melissa and Tony, they had to wait for the judges to tour the entire expo and thoroughly explore each exhibit, as they took their jobs very seriously. Tony looked towards Melissa and gave her a thumbs up, indicating she did well. Melissa had a small grin and gave him a nod of thanks. The day soon passed with more people coming to see their exhibits. Eventually, everyone was summoned to a big auditorium. Melissa and Tony sat next to each other as they saw the judges walk towards the podium. Be prepared to lose, Melissa said teasingly. Oh, someone is getting a bit of an ego. Maybe they're spending too much time with bad influences, Tony retorted. You definitely are a bad influence, Melissa nodded. Tony scoffed before paying attention as a man with a handlebar mustache walked up ahead of the other judges, one of whom was a woman and another who was a bit chubby. I hope everyone had a wonderful time today at the expo. Let's give every participant a round of applause for their time and effort. After the round of applause, the man put up a hand to stop it. Now then, there were many great entries in the expo this year. Some were unique, some were interesting, and some were even revolutionary. But unfortunately, not everyone can be a winner at the expo. My fellow judges and I took our time to examine and study every invention very thoroughly. We will now announce the top five contestants we have carefully chosen. In fifth place, we have... Tony tuned them out as he didn't really care much and was just interested in hearing his or Melissa's name. In fourth place, the top three, second place goes to, it was at that time that Tony raised an eyebrow, since second place didn't belong to either Melissa or him. 
Now, this came as a shock to us, as it will be to you all here today. For the first time in history, we have our first Stark Expo tie. Bullshit, Tony thought, already figuring it out. Melissa wasn't any different. Her eyebrows twitched in annoyance as she knew what was coming. The two winners of the Expo are Anthony Stark and Melissa Shield. Anthony Stark's invention, the Baymax, has the potential to help millions of people and could revolutionize healthcare. Meanwhile, Melissa Shield created multiple extraordinary inventions that replicate quirks and include her remarkable support items. Both Anthony and Melissa looked at each other, both wearing the same irritated expression. Let's give them both a round of applause and welcome them up to the stage to receive their awards. As people clapped, Melissa and Tony walked towards the stage, giving each other side glances. They approached the judges who shook their hands. Congratulations to the two of you. They both wore apathetic expressions and gave the most casual speeches they could muster. After the award ceremony, Tony and Melissa met up with their parents. So, did you two enjoy yourselves? Howard asked. No, they both replied, clearly unsatisfied. But you both won. That's fantastic, David said with a smile. Tony and Melissa clicked their tongues and looked to the side, irritated. There's no such thing as two winners, Melissa said, narrowing her eyes at her father. Hearing this, Howard laughed loudly. Ha 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 ha. She's becoming a Stark now. David sighed and grumbled to Howard. Your son is corrupting my daughter. Make him stop. Howard just put a hand on David's shoulder. Just embrace it, old friend. Just embrace it. Maria shook her head and giggled. She watched as Tony put his hands in his pockets and started to walk away, leaning forward a bit. Melissa walked close to him with a pout. Where are you two going? Maria asked. Home. They both said at the same time, clearly still irritated by how everything turned out. But there's still more to the expo, Howard said. We're done with the expo. It's a stupid thing in the first place, Tony grumbled, while Melissa nodded in agreement. I mean, we mostly came here for them. If they don't want to be here, we can't really force them, Howard said. Nice try. You still need to get some work done around here as you're the owner. Don't worry about the kids. I'll take them home, David said with a scoff, while Howard grumbled at being found out. Maybe Tony was right. It is a stupid thing in the first place, Howard mumbled. Maria rolled her eyes and patted his back. Don't worry. I'll stay here with you. David, please take care of them until we get home. David nodded and soon followed after the kids as they ended their trip to the Stark Expo earlier than planned. Third person's POV. After the Expo, Tony and Melissa stopped building armors for a while. They mainly focused on studying and building their knowledge. Since Tony knew he was going to be popular, he decided to spread his name as it would help him when he took over the Stark branch in Japan in the upcoming months. In the following months, Tony spent his time studying, solving difficult mathematical equations, and learning multiple languages, mainly Japanese, as he knew that would be the language he would mostly be speaking. At just nine years old, Tony Stark managed to gain an Abel Prize, which is the Nobel Prize for Mathematics, and a Nobel Prize for Energy Research. This took most of the world by surprise due to his young age, but they soon understood since he was a Stark. Tony and Melissa quickly turned 10 years old. Tony and Melissa were standing in front of a private jet with Howard, David, and Maria in front of them. You can change your mind if you want to, princess, David said, looking at Melissa sadly. Melissa went and hugged her father. I'll miss you, daddy. Tears flowed down his face as he hugged Melissa tightly. Maria wasn't any different, almost choking Tony with how tightly she was hugging him. Mother, we have a private jet, which means you can visit whenever you want, Tony said in a strained voice. It doesn't matter. I'm going to miss you, Maria cried out. Howard just gave Tony a pat on the shoulder. The board of directors will be waiting for you to take over as you arrive. They will greatly underestimate you due to your age. Show them hell, son. Aren't they like our employees or something? Shouldn't you be saying something like go easy on them or listen to what they have to say since they have experience? Howard scoffed. Oh, please. Experience means nothing in front of our stark genius. Tony just smiled. I guess I'll have no choice but to give them hell, as you say. Howard smiled as they said their goodbyes. When you arrive, 
a chauffeur should be waiting to take you to the Yairozu residence. Be sure to behave and not shame the Stark name. With that piece of advice, Tony and Melissa entered the private jet. Although Melissa had tears in her eyes. You can video call your dad anytime you want. So if you ever miss him too much, it should be pretty easy. As I said earlier, we have a private jet. Melissa wiped her tears, I'm sorry. It's just that I haven't been away from my dad like this before. Tony didn't say anything and just patted her head to make her feel a little better. They saw the indication to buckle up, and soon Tony and Melissa took to the skies. During their flight to get Melissa's mind off missing her dad, they started to plan what they were going to do with Stark Industries. Tony pulled out his tablet and presented her with the plans. Here's what I was able to come up with in the meantime. As you are my secretary, you will be the only one allowed to preview any of this. I see, Melissa said as she swiped through the tablet, quickly reading and analyzing everything. Wait, are there really so many people embezzling money? Melissa asked in surprise. Tony nodded. There are mainly two reasons why they're doing this. One, they believe that since we have so much money, we won't notice the money disappearing since we will gain it right back in seconds. Two, they believe we won't really care since they're just a branch company and nothing else. Melissa nodded in understanding as she continued to study everything. After a few hours, they arrived at their destination. When they arrived at the airport with their bags, they found a Japanese man wearing a typical chauffeur outfit holding a sign that read, Anthony Stark and Melissa Shield, a slash N. They will be speaking Japanese from here on out. The chauffeur, upon seeing them, nodded and took their bags, follow me. They arrived in front of a limo. The chauffeur opened the door for them, and once Tony and Melissa were inside, he put their bags in the trunk before driving off to their destination. After close to an hour, they arrived in front of a big, beautiful mansion. In front was a large black gate, and by the side of it was a sign that read, The Yairozu Residence. The chauffeur rolled down the window and pressed on the intercom, I have brought over the guests. The black gate then parted, and the limo went inside. Once in, the chauffeur opened the door for Tony and Melissa. They grabbed their bags and walked towards the front door. As they were about to knock, a maid opened it. Inside, they were greeted by a Japanese man with short black hair and black eyes, wearing a business suit, and a woman with long black hair in a spiky ponytail. Tony and Melissa bowed in a Japanese greeting, and the couple did the same with a smile. You must be Anthony Stark. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Hiroshi Yairozu. Tony and Hiroshi shook hands. As you mentioned, my name is Anthony Stark. My father mentioned a bit about you. All good things, I hope, he said with a smile. The woman then introduced herself. My name is Ayako Yairozu. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. And you must be Melissa Shield. Melissa nodded as she introduced herself. Ayako then reached behind her, revealing a little girl about their age, looking at them with curiosity. Her hair was down straight with a bit sticking out forward. This is my daughter, Momo Yairozu. She should be about your age. Come and say hi, Momo. Momo shyly gave them a little wave. Hello, she said in a small voice. After Tony and Melissa greeted her, Hiroshi guided them to the room they would be staying in. After a bow of thanks, they were left alone to organize their rooms, which were connected to each other by a door. Melissa held her chest as she let out a sigh of relief. Whoa, that was nerve-wracking. It wasn't so bad. It was just a bit awkward since, for one, we're just children no older than their daughter, and two, we literally just met. Once we get past this initial awkward stage, it should be simple. Who knows, you might even become good friends with their daughter. But we're not here to make friends. We're here on business, ouch, Melissa said, holding her forehead in pain after Tony flicked it. What was that for? She glared, for saying something stupid. Melissa, it's okay to relax and make friends. We're gonna be here for a long time. I'm sure being friends with just me must be driving you crazy. Plus, you also need to socialize with other kids your age. Why are you acting all mature all of a sudden? Because while we're here, it's my job to make sure you're all right. If anything happened to you, I wouldn't be able to look David in the face. Melissa gave a little pout as she blushed slightly. Well, stop treating me like a little girl. 
Aha, uh -huh, Tony said uncaringly. After setting your things up, we have a meeting, so hurry up. Melissa let out a sigh. We just got off a plane. Can't we rest? After the meeting, we can sleep all we want, Tony said. But the meeting is with Mr. Yairozu himself. He isn't going anywhere, Melissa sighed. You know how I am about getting things done quickly and efficiently, Tony said. Melissa only sighed and nodded, knowing that as his secretary, she wasn't allowed to complain much and had to follow what Tony wanted. Third person's POV. Hiroshi and Ayako were in their office discussing their new house guest when they heard a knock on the door. Who is it? It's Anthony Stark. They told me this is where I would most likely find you, Tony said from the other side of the door. Ayako and Hiroshi exchanged curious glances. Come in, Hiroshi said with a smile, intrigued by what Tony wanted to say. Tony entered with Melissa, who was carrying a tablet close to her chest and standing a bit behind him. Hope I'm not interrupting anything, he said, looking at Ayako and then at Hiroshi. Nonsense, we were just discussing your arrival. Is there anything you need? Anything you're unsatisfied with? We've just got here. It would seem weird if I was already unsatisfied with something, Tony said with a straight face. Hiroshi scratched his head and gave an awkward smile. I suppose you're right. Ayako covered her mouth and let out a small chuckle. Anyways, I want to make a deal with you. I noticed that although you are Japan's main supplier for material, you don't deal with Stark Industries, and I can already guess why. Hiroshi smiled. Are you sure you want to discuss business right now? You two just got off a long flight. You should be resting. I like efficiency, Tony replied. Hiroshi nodded. Well then, yes, I don't deal with Stark Industries. Although I respect Howard and think of him as a great friend. Dealing with the Japanese branch of Stark Industries doesn't bring me any profit whatsoever. I suspected as much. Melissa? Melissa presented her tablet with a stylus and put it on Hiroshi's desk. Hiroshi took the tablet with a confused look and began to examine its contents. Ayako looked over his shoulder, also studying it. What is this? Calculations. Calculations? Ayako repeated. Tony nodded. I calculated my future profits based on the economics of this country. The future of the stock market, geopolitical stability, technological advancements, potential regulatory changes, and consumer trends. My analysis also factored in variables such as currency fluctuations, interest rates, inflation projections, and the impact of global trade policies. I also estimated your profits and gains to the last decimal. Hiroshi studied everything carefully and nodded. This is really impressive stuff. But what you're asking me is to take a gamble and hope that all of your calculations are correct. How would I know these are correct? And how would I know I would truly be making the right choice by signing with you? Foremost, I don't like my competence being questioned. So you can drop your little test. When you looked at it, you already started doing the calculations yourself and know these are right. You're only making a fool out of yourself, Tony said with a straight face. Melissa and Ayako looked at Tony in surprise. Ayako turned toward Hiroshi, expecting him to be angry at being spoken to like that. But all she saw was a smile on his face. Hiroshi chuckled and shook his head. You Starks and your pride, he said, taking the stylus, scrolling to the bottom and signing the document. I'm taking a huge gamble with this, so don't disappoint me, he said, finishing the signature and handing the tablet back to Melissa. Tony scoffed and started walking away. If you've truly been a friend of my father, you should know the last thing we Starks do is disappoint. With that, Tony exited, and Melissa quickly followed behind him. Ayako and Hiroshi were now alone in the room. Ayako looked at Hiroshi strangely. Didn't you sign that way too quickly? You didn't realize? Hiroshi asked with a smile. Realize what? That kid doesn't really need us. He's doing us a favor. What? Ayako asked in surprise. Hiroshi nodded. If he truly needed suppliers, he would have become one himself and probably overtaken us. He signed a deal with us for two reasons. First, it's like rent for him, a thank you for letting him stay here. And second, he already said it, he likes efficiency. Although he could become a supplier on his own, it's more efficient for him to just sign a deal with us. Okay, I understand the second one, but how did you get the first one out of all that?
I already said it, it's their stark pride. They don't like owing debts. Although we're letting them stay here due to our close relationship with Howard, he and I don't have that friendship, so for him, he is practically staying here for free. Seriously? Ayako asked in astonishment. Hiroshi nodded. He's one scary kid. What the hell was that? Melissa asked. What? Why were you being so rude? I know you don't like being tested, but wasn't that a little too much? Tony simply rolled his eyes. Because what he did was a test within a test, which is even more annoying. Melissa looked at him in confusion. What was the test? He wanted to get a glimpse of my personality, to see if I'm confident and all that jazz. Huh? Why would he do that? Tell me. Would you make a bet against someone who is uncertain about themselves or lets others walk all over them? No? He's the same. He wouldn't have cared if I was my father's son. If he saw that I was unconfident, that would have been a potential loss of profit for him. He's a businessman at heart, which is why he and my father got along. Furthermore, he would have declined to sign the deal if I had answered him otherwise. Melissa was shocked to hear that. But he didn't seem that way to me. Like I said, a test behind a test. He used that first question as a cover to hide his intention. This is why I hate dealing with politics, even if it's just in business. You have to listen to their every word, look at their expression, their body language, their single muscle spasm, just to figure out what they truly are thinking and saying. If you misread it or miss anything, it could lead to a loss. That, that seems really complicated. It's not complicated. It's annoying, is what it is. Anyways, that's it. You can get some rest now, Tony said, feeling tired himself. Melissa nodded, and with a good night, they both went off to their rooms to rest. The next day, in the board of directors meeting room, there were 12 members in total. Five were female, while the other seven were males. They were all seated at a long table, with the main chair in front being empty. One of the men had an irritated expression. He had black slicked back hair, black eyes, slanted eyes, and sharp ears, but his irritated expression was just a masquerade for his true feelings. He was furious. They demoted me for a damn child just because of who his daddy is. Others, who had different color and shaped hair, looked towards the irritated man with worried expressions. Just as they were about to question where their new boss was, the door opened. Tony, wearing a black suit, entered with Melissa, wearing her lab coat, glasses, and holding her signature tablet with a stack of paper on top of it. Hello, everyone. Tony greeted with a happy-go-lucky smile, waving towards them before sitting down in the main chair that faced everyone, with Melissa standing next to him. Now that I have your attention, after Tony said this, his smile dropped as he gained a cold expression, clasping his hands on the table and looking towards everyone. His sudden demeanor surprised everyone, but before they had a chance to say anything, Tony continued. It has come to my attention that some of you have been embezzling money from my company. Everyone's eyes widened until the slanted eye man slammed his hands on the table. You can't just enter here and make such accusations. Melissa was all Tony said. Melissa walked around and started handing out the papers she brought. In your hands is all the evidence you need. As you can see, it matches with the data from the company, which should tell you I'm not just making accusations. Tony surveyed the room and noticed some people got nervous, while others looked at each other suspiciously, trying to identify the culprits. Hiroto Yamato, Takashi Tanaka, and Aiko Takahashi. You three have one day to fully return all the money you have embezzled, or be prepared to face the consequences. And to that, I swear on my stark name. Hiroto, the man with the slanted eyes, had a look of horror as he stared into the unforgiving eyes of Tony, who looked right at him. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.